uh, our first session titled Health Equity in Rare Epilepsies is a discussion where we will learn about some of the health inequities in the rare epilepsies space and what are the challenges of inclusion? How can someone get involved in a clinical trial from a rural town? Uh, our discussion today, Health Equity in Rare Epilepsies, are thrilled to have a remarkable person as our first presenter, Dr. Jacqueline French, Chief Medical and Innovation Officer at the Epilepsy Foundation and Epileptologist at NYU Langone Health, here to speak once again about the rare epilepsies, getting the best care for everyone. Dr. French, we're so glad to have you. Uh, we look forward to an excellent talk. Uh, please come off mute and we will get started. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much. I'm uh, thrilled to be here and I'm gonna try and share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, getting the best care for everyone um, uh, and, and making sure that you understand how to get the best care. These are my disclosures. Uh, in addition to working for the Epilepsy Foundation, I also uh, am director of something called the Epilepsy Study Consortium, which is a nonprofit that works with many different companies, many of them in the rare space now, who are trying to bring new therapies to people with epilepsy. So I'm going to start with talking about the pillars of optimal care. The first, and one I'm going to spend a lot of time on because it is a roadblock for many people, and it's extremely important, is diagnosis, which in the best of all possible worlds, particularly in children, should be fast and accurate. The second is treatment, um, access to doctors and health resources, appropriate selection of treatment, and appropriate escalation to more aggressive treatment when that's warranted. A little bit about monitoring, a little bit about rescue therapy, which I think is an important pillar of optimal care. A little bit about transition to adult care for kids. So let's get started with diagnosis. Um, so this is actually uh, a slide that I took that is true for all rare diseases, not only the epilepsy rare diseases. And it gives you sort of an idea of the diagnostic path that many people take. Uh, the first time that a patient in, uh, or a parent notices that there is a sign or symptom of something wrong, they may not you know, be willing to accept it or they may not know whether this is a normal thing or a not normal thing. So there may be quite an interval until they actually say, no, really, there, there seems to be something wrong here. I need to go talk to a doctor. But the doctor that they talk to initially may just be their primary care doctor. And the primary care doctor may try and figure this out for a period of time. Uh, again, time goes by before that person may be referred to specialist care. And as I'm going to talk about, in the case of epilepsy, it may even be more so because there may be a time to refer to a neurologist and then more time to refer to an epileptologist or somebody who specializes in epilepsy. Um, and all of that time, uh, the individual, the child, may not have a diagnosis. Um, and then even in the specialist's hands, there is going to be a delay as diagnostic workup is, uh, occurs until a diagnosis is made. So there's a lot of, of periods of time uh, particularly in a young child's life, and we really want to make this diagnosis quickly. Unfortunately, uh, the Child Neurology Foundation says that the average length of time from symptom onset to an accurate diagnosis of a rare disease in the neurology space is about five years. And in addition to that, uh, in their uh, uh, assessment in 2021, they did a child neurology and caregiver assessment. Almost half of caregivers reported that they had a misdiagnosis before they got to a, a correct diagnosis. And if you look at this uh, result of their survey, you can see that um, only 48%, less than half of the children were diagnosed in less than a year. And that's 
not when, you know, that first part where people are trying to figure out if there's something wrong, but actually after they went to see a doctor. And 30% of the time, it took between one and four years. And the rest of the patients, 20%, it took over five years, five to 10, or in 10%, even more than 10 years, and 3% remained undiagnosed. And, and I think that you will agree with me that families can't wait a decade for a diagnosis. And the diagnostic odyssey in the rare epilepsies even takes on a greater um, impact because the children with rare epilepsy may face really three diagnostic delays. The first delay is, are seizures happening? The second delay is, well, there are seizures, but what is the syndrome? The third is, okay, now I understand what the syndrome is, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what a syndrome is, but what's the cause of the syndrome? And this I've put in red because it is extremely important. Every child, every adult with epilepsy should have a syndromic diagnosis. Not everyone will know what the cause of their epilepsy is, but everybody should have a syndromic diagnosis. So if you out there don't know what you or your child's syndromic diagnosis is, please, please, please go to your doctor and ask, what is my epilepsy syndrome? What is my child's epilepsy syndrome? And if they can't answer that question, that means you need to seek a higher level of care. So the first issue, was it a seizure? Because there are many other things that can happen that cause brief changes in behavior, sleep disorders, behavioral uh, events, even reflux, movement disorders, uh, cardiac events. So the first thing that a doctor is going to need to do is to figure out, and usually this will take an EEG, and sometimes it requires long EEG or EEG monitoring, to determine that in fact epilepsy is going on and that the events that are occurring are epileptic events, which are defined as sudden changes in electrical activity of the brain accompanied by changes in behavior. The second issue is diagnosing the syndrome. So what is an epilepsy syndrome? An epilepsy syndrome is a cluster of features, a group of features that a doctor can recognize that tells them something about this particular presentation of epilepsy. And it's gonna be different for different syndromes what the doctor has to put together. It's not simple, it's complex because it can include what type of seizures are happening, what age did they start, uh, if they know at that point what, what caused the seizures, were they inherited or is there a gene involved, what part of the brain is involved, what provokes the seizures, how severe are they and how frequent are they, how do they pattern over the course of the day. The, the electroencephalogram, the brain waves, during and between seizures also may be necessary. It's not always necessary, but it may be necessary to diagnose the syndrome, as well as brain imaging, other what we call comorbidities or, <coughs> or other disorders that come along with the seizures. Is there uh, a problem with, with thinking or cognition? Is there a problem with walking? Is there a problem with behavior, with mood? Uh, with the GI system, is there, um, are there facial features that go along with it? There are many things that go into diagnosing the syndrome. And once you know what, <coughs> what the syndrome is, it's going to be very helpful <coughs> for a number of things, which I'll get into. Um, so uh, diagnosing the syndrome, this is a very complicated slide but I want you to focus on the bottom. The bottom are the syndromes that usually come along with developmental delay, and this is where many of the rare epilepsies are. <coughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a cold. <coughs> but you'll see some names that you may recognize, such as <coughs> Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, <coughs> West syndrome or infantile spasms, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> You'll have to excuse me. Give me a sec. <coughs> <coughs> I 
And it's important to make a syndromic diagnosis because you can actually make seizures worse if you give the wrong drug <coughs> to a person with a syndrome. Excuse me for one minute. I'm just going to get a cough drop. As Dr. French uh, takes uh, gets a little bit of relief and no rush, Dr. French, we want you uh, to be well and feeling well. I want to welcome you to our first session focused on health equity in the rare epilepsy space. Dr. French is joining us uh, today as the, the, the Chief Innovations and Medical Officer at the Epilepsy Foundation. Uh, it is just early on here discussing different uh, syndromatic uh, diagnoses and our first tip uh, that came in the start of discussing the diagnostic odyssey in rare epilepsies. Uh, we are feeling uh, really, really good. Once again, a quick housekeeping note uh, that if you have a question for Dr. French during her presentation or any of our presenters, uh, please drop it into the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen uh, to type your question. Uh, and then secondly, uh, as we move along here, uh, please be taking notes uh, and uh, being prepared uh, to continue the conversation moving forward. We're so glad you're joining us. And as you do, please also drop into the chat about where you're joining us from uh, the Midwest or the United States. Dr. French, you're back. Hope you're feeling better. Yeah, well, <clears throat> that's a first for me, but uh, where's a cough drop when you need one? So. Um, you need a syndromic diagnosis, first of all, to make sure that you're not going to make things worse. And there are some medications, CBZ is carbamazepine or Tegretol, PHT is phenytoin uh, or Dilantin. These are very commonly used drugs. LTG is Lamotrigine, another commonly used drug. So these are drugs that can make these syndromes actually worse. And many of the times that we see worsening, it is in the rare epilepsies. So the third issue of diagnostic delay, once you have a syndromic diagnosis, is what caused the epilepsy. And that is different often from what we call the syndrome. So there can be many different causes, genetic, structural, infectious, metabolic, and immune. And knowing what those are, is going to help you uh, in treatment and in prognosis and knowing what's going to happen next. And of course, there are those people, as I mentioned before, where the diagnosis is not known and never, the underlying cause is not known and never will be known, unfortunately. Now, it is important to know who is making the diagnosis. And there are, unfortunately, an insufficient number of specialists. And not all pediatric neurologists even have epilepsy expertise or training. And that's another important point um, is that you may think, okay, now I'm with a pediatric neurologist and therefore I have the best and the highest level of care I possibly can, but that is not exactly true. Not all pediatric neurologists are specialists in epilepsy. And some of them, in fact, are specialists in other things. Um, I just actually was talking to some colleagues of mine who are pediatric neurologists, asking them whether they thought that, um, who are epilepsy pediatric neurologists, whether they thought their colleagues who were not special, specialists in epilepsy could always make a diagnosis. And they agreed that, that, in fact, they could not always make a diagnosis. So do seek out the highest level of care that you can. Uh, but unfortunately, talking about equity and access to care, less than half of families even live within 50 miles of a specialist, and traveling to a specialist may be a hardship for many people in terms of finances, in terms of taking care of other children, in terms of transportation or other things. Fortunately, we do have telemedicine now that is helping out to some extent in terms of getting people access to specialists, even if they don't live nearby. But um, I could only find this information for adults, but I'm sure it's true for children too. This is a national health interview survey from, from 2010 and 2017 done by the Centers for Disease Control. And you can see that 
among uh, adults with active epilepsy, um, almost half of them in 2010 only saw a general doctor. Um, and uh, it's a little better in 2017, but still about a third were only seeing a general doctor, um, whereas some saw a neurologist or a specialist only, many saw both, and a few unfortunately did not see a doctor at all. So we still have a ways to go to make sure that people do get access to good care. Um, I'm going to give you an example <coughs> in regards to diagnosis, uh, syndrome versus cause with a very common rare epilepsy called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So Lennox-Gastaut syndrome is a syndrome that, uh, that has an age of onset between three and five years old. Uh, and the children who have Lennox-Gastaut have multiple seizure types, often daily seizures. They often fall with their seizures. They have drop attacks. They have a very typical pattern on EEG, and they suffer from developmental delay. A good neurologist should absolute, absolutely be able to diagnose Lennox-Gastaut syndrome from these things. It's a rare disease. It happens uh, in one or two per million children. But even within the Lennox-Gastaut population, there are many causes of Lennox-Gastaut that are also rare. So for example, there are a number of genes I've listed here that can present with a Lennox-Gastaut presentation. Another relatively common rare epilepsy is epilepsy associated with tuberous sclerosis complex. Uh, that is a genetic disease. And that they also can present with Lennox-Gastaut, although they can also present with other syndromes. And cortical dysplasia, um, is a non-genetic disorder that can also present with Lennox-Gastaut, as can many other things. So <clears throat> if a child has Lennox-Gastaut and also has a genetic um, mutation, then they actually have more than one rare disease. And so just diagnosing the Lennox-Gastaut is not sufficient. The physician, if they're less experienced, may make the diagnosis of Lennox-Gastaut and say, okay, I feel good, I've made a syndromic diagnosis, and that's good. But both the syndrome, Lennox-Gastaut, and the underlying cause of the syndrome, whether it be genetic or something else, may be important in determining both the treatment and the prognosis. That is, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen in the long term. So can finding a cause improve outcomes. It helps with the why, the what else, and the what next. So um, I, I actually listened to um, a really heart-rending story from a mother of a child with Lennox-Gastaut who uh, spent her entire life wondering what caused her child to have this disorder. Did she have any you know, cause in this? Was it something that happened during birth, which you know, is one cause of Lennox-Gastaut? Um, or something that she did during pregnancy. And it was only when the, when the individual was 20 years old that she went for genetic testing and a rare genetic mutation was uncovered. And the family talked about how important it was to know the cause and end the diagnostic odyssey and understand um, why this happened uh, and also this, again, can help to understand what may happen in terms of more progression of the disease, uh, et cetera. In addition, understanding the cause can help you understand what other things might happen. A uh, good example is tuberous sclerosis complex, where in addition to seizures, you can have tumors that grow, you can have kidney disease, and other things that it is important to know about because the child will need monitoring, not just for the seizures, but for the other things that come along with them. And again, prognosis, what's going to happen next? It also helps you to optimize treatment and also, if necessary, provide genetic counseling, what's gonna happen to other children in the family or relatives. The International League Against Epilepsy has subdivided 
uh, causes of epilepsy into a number of different buckets. Uh, one is structural. There's actually something that you can see on an imaging study, a CAT scan or an MRI that's causing the seizures, whether it's a tumor or a stroke or uh, a cortical dysplasia, another thing that I mentioned. Genetic, is there an underlying genetic mutation? Was it infectious? Uh, was there a viral cause or a bacterial meningitis, for example? There are a number of metabolic disturbances that cause epilepsy, really important as I'm going to show you to be able to diagnose, uh, immune causes, uh, and then the unknown. So if there are metabolic causes, the ketogenic diet can sometimes be useful or vitamin therapy. If it's a structural cause that can be found, then surgery is sometimes useful. If it's a genetic cause, then there can be targeted drug therapy towards that genetic cause, uh, and hopefully soon, uh, gene-based therapies. So this is just the example um, of a very, very severe epilepsy that it's really important to know the cause. This is a vitamin B6 responsive epilepsy. Vitamin B is a very important vitamin to the brain, and the inability of the body to uh, convert vitamin B to what, what is needed for the brain to function properly can be caused by a number of genetic mutations. And it can present with drug-resistant seizures, which are often myoclonic, in the first days of life. And as you can see here, if you give the proper treatment, which is basically vitamin B, then you can turn this nasty EEG with lots of spikes to a completely normal EEG. So making an, an early diagnosis of this condition is brain-saving and life-saving. The number of genes that have been associated with epilepsy has skyrocketed um, with the development of something called next-generation sequencing, which is a, a kind of genetic testing. So we, we now understand and can diagnose many, many, many uh, mutations that affect the brain and can cause seizures. And as you can see, there are lots of different kinds of genetic testing. And another thing that many of you probably already know, but if you don't, if, you, if your child had genetic testing some time ago, then we have made enormous advances um, in genetic testing. Um, <clears throat> and now we do whole gene sequencing, and you can see that whereas <clears throat> before, with previous kinds of genetic testing, there were some things that were found, some types of mutations that were found, but others that were missed. Uh, and now we can find many, many more types. So even if genetic testing was negative in the past, it is sometimes important to get that genetic testing repeated or at least ask the doctor whether it's worthwhile to repeat. <clears throat> and we do know that there is a high yield of genetic testing in the epilepsies. And now, particularly in the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, about a third of children will have a mutation in a gene uncovered if whole genome sequencing is done. And it's not only kids, because in adults, um, this just shows you the kind of uh, genes that are most commonly uncovered, SCN1A, KCNQ2, CDKL5, PDH19. These are ones that you may recognize or know. But in adults, uh, we find that in, in adults who have developmental delay, particularly, and have not had genetic testing when they were children, that we can still many, many times uncover genetic uh, disturbances later in life. So this, um, what this is showing you right here, all of these people were tested when they were adults over 18, but when did their epilepsy start? Well, if their epilepsy started between the age of zero and one year old, then 30% of the time you may find a genetic defect. Um, and 
as the, as the age of onset of epilepsy gets older and older, the likelihood of finding a genetic defect gets lower and lower, but does not go to zero. And why do we want to know about these genetic defects? Well, we're coming to the age of pre precision therapy to fix mutations. And I'm just giving you one example because it's in the clinic right now in clinical trials. Um, and that is um, from Stoke Therapeutics. Um, they are creating what's called an antisense oligonucleotide or an ASO. Um, this is a similar approach. It's already been highly successful for another rare uh, genetic disease. It happens to be a neuromuscular disease. And the brain is a lot more complicated than the muscle, but still this approach has worked in a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. And what this antisense oligonucleotide does is it, you know, in, in many of these uh, mutations that cause epilepsy, you have one good gene and you have one bad gene. So the good gene is happily making whatever the protein is that's necessary for the brain to function. The bad gene is not, which means you only have half as much protein as you need for a good healthy brain. And what this does is it stokes the ability of the good gene to make more protein and make up for the bad gene. Now this is an approach that needs to be delivered by spinal infusion every few months, which is not ideal. Um, uh, but if it actually works in some of these conditions, and believe me, there are more and more companies making more and more antisense oligonucleotides for more and more genetic disorders, no matter how rare, um, if this works, then it might not only stop seizures, but it might prevent other of the things that go along with seizures when you don't have that protein in the brain, perhaps uh, including the ability to think properly, to walk properly, sleep, and other things. I'm going to move on to treatment. And just to <clears throat> remind you of the current way that we treat epilepsy, um, we try a drug. And if the drug doesn't work, we try combination drugs. And unfortunately, in the, in the rare epilepsies that are severe, often children are on many, many drugs, not just one or two. And if two drugs fail to control seizures, we say you have drug-resistant epilepsy. And in fact, m many, many children with rare epilepsy have drug-resistant epilepsy. At that time, people should be considering a number of elevated, escalated levels of care including uh, different anti-seizure medicines, including clinical trials, <coughs> vagus nerve <coughs> stimulation, uh, other kinds of stimulators, such as the responsive neurostimulator and the deep brain stimulator. These are not currently available for children, but they will be. Surgical intervention, um, laser ablation if it's possible, and one that I will talk about a little more, which is the ketogenic diet. When we're talking about anti-seizure medicines, the interesting thing is that in the last, um, let's say, 15 years, we have switched from making anti-seizure medicines just for the common epilepsies, and many, many companies are focusing on making anti-seizure medicines for the rare epilepsies. And you can see on this list, this is all of the medications that have been approved since 2008 for the treatment of epilepsy. And you can see in green how many of them are actually targeted at the rare epilepsies, with the most recent one being the first approval for CDKL5 deficiency disorder, again associated with a genetic mutation in the CDKL5 gene, ganaxalone that just came literally weeks ago. Um, and the other thing that you will notice here is that some of these are targeted at syndromes. We already talked about Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Infantile spasms is another syndrome. Um, Dravet is actually a syndrome that's associated with a gene, um, uh, SCN1A mutation. Um, 
And here, we're, again, we're, we're seeing that uh, further down the line, some of these medications are not targeted at syndromes, but are actually targeted at genetic mutations, such as Dravet, Lennox Gasto, uh, Dravet tuberous sclerosis, and CDKL5. So that's why knowing the syndrome is important, knowing the cause is important. <clears throat> so because, for example, there are many different causes of some of these syndromes, it may mean that some medications may work for some people and may not work for others. Because as I mentioned, the same patient may be part of several orphan groups. Um, for example, you may start with infantile spasms leading to Lennox-Gastaut, and all of that may be as a result of tuberous sclerosis. So over the course of a child's early life, they've already gotten three rare diagnoses. Fortunately, there are some drugs that actually are good for a number of different underlying syndromes and causes. So for example, uh, several of the drugs on the, on the uh, slide I showed you are, are effective in both lennox gesto and tuberous sclerosis. Um, people with rare epilepsies have many symptoms, comorbidities as we say, and treating seizures may make other things worse, such as behavior. So we have to be very expert in picking therapies that are likely not to aggravate other issues that people are having. And epileptic encephalopathies, which is what we call the very severe epilepsies associated with the rare epilepsies, may have their own trajectory up or down, which are independent from therapy. So it's a little harder to determine sometimes whether a therapy is successful. But it is really important to have access to the newer therapies and an epilepsy center and epileptologists are more likely to properly use new therapies because they use a lot of them and they understand how to use them. And most importantly, may also be able to navigate the things that are necessary in order because these th new therapies are extremely expensive. And um, the epilepsy center, more than just the doctor, but all of the doctor's staff has to be able to navigate prior authorizations that are often needed to get access to these new therapies and other barriers to use. And you know, I will tell you right now, this is one major issue that leads to inequities in care. If you can't get to an epileptologist, you often can't get access to these new therapies just because you can't navigate the system or the doctor can't navigate the system. Consider a clinical trial. That's one of the things that, that you are talking about this morning. Clinical trials allow access to new therapies before they are commercially available. I gave you an example of one, which is the Stoke uh, trial for Dravet syndrome. Um, often, some people will receive a placebo during some part of the trial. That's like a sugar pill that you compare to the active treatment. But at the end of the, the usually, the observation period, everybody will have access to the drug. And importantly, trials are free of charge to participants, and even sometimes people will pay a lot of money uh, for a participant to come to the center from a long distance away. Even if it's sometimes an airplane flight away, uh, there will be uh, available funds to get that child to the center, depending on how rare the epilepsy is. So these are things, you know, even if you don't live close to a, an epilepsy center, you can inquire at uh, uh, the nearest epilepsy center, or you can inquire of the Epilepsy Foundation uh, what clinical trials might be appropriate for my child. So it is important to move on to more aggressive therapies if anti-seizure medicines look like they're failing including, as I said, the ketogenic diet, surgery, neurostimulation. I'm gonna stop a little bit and talk about the ketogenic diet. Um, many of you probably know about this, but it is a, a very, very strict diet uh, that redistributes calorie uh, contribution 
so that very, very little comes from carbohydrates, rice, bread, uh, potato, etc. And 75% comes from fat. That's not very easy. It has to be very carefully calculated by a center that understands how to do it, um, and 20% from protein. But if you can get on the ketogenic diet, and it is very effective for some of the rare epilepsies and children with severe epilepsy, you can see what the results are. This is just a single uh, center, the Mayo Clinic, uh, which used the ketogenic diet, uh, and you can see that the blue bar here is children that were completely seizure-free on the diet, and the yellow bar is children that were 75 to 99 percent reduced in their seizures, and the purple bar is children who had uh, a 50 to 75 percent reduction in seizures. So you can see that um, this is a very effective therapy, some children are able to wean off the diet because they've been seizure-free so long they don't need it anymore. That comes in at two years. Um, and then, of course, some of them don't have a good effect or uh, they have a side effect and uh, it doesn't work for them. But it's definitely worth a try. Um, and in order to try on the ketogenic diet, you have to be at a center that knows how to do it. And this is like so important that, in fact, the International League Against Epilepsy uh, weighed in saying um, that there should be access to the ketogenic diet um, at it, all over the globe. You know, this is an access to care issue that people should have access to the ketogenic diet. Um, so here is a report. What are the minimum requirements for ketogenic diet services in resource limited regions? So, you know, the recommendations are that children should have access because it is a very effective therapy. I wanted to take a minute to talk about rescue therapies because I do think that they are an important aspect of care. So, what is a rescue therapy? It is a treatment that is not given every day but can be used when seizures are clustering, which means one is coming one after another, um, or you can treat when you think that there's a risk of seizures that's higher than usual. For example, a child has a high fever, kind of like an EpiPen for seizures, and many people can, have, uh, can benefit from having a rescue therapy available, and particularly children with the rare epilepsies with developmental and epileptic encephalopathy are often at a great risk for status epilepticus and seizure clusters, and almost every one of those children, or I would say every one of those children, should have rescue therapy available. Um, and there are a number of new rescue therapies that are now available. It used to be that the only thing that was available was a rectal rescue therapy, and that still may be appropriate for, for babies and young children. But now we have nasal therapies, such as nasal midazolam, nasal diazepam. We have what's called buckle, which means you can put it under the, the cheek, uh, and it can uh, dissolve there. And in development in clinical trials going on right now, a trial that you could be involved in um, if you're over 18 years old, uh, is inhaled alprazolam, which is uh, really like uh, an inhaler for epilepsy and may work very quickly in two minutes or less. And the rescue therapy should be used <coughs> in conjunction with a rescue plan, which is the who, what, and when of rescue therapy. Um, and again, everybody should have from their doctor a rescue plan. And if you don't have a rescue plan, you need to go to your doctor and say, I need a rescue plan for my child or for myself. Um, and this tells you what to do under different circumstances to try and stop an emergency before it happens. And uh, the seizure action plan form can be accessed at epilepsy.com. A little bit about monitoring. Anywhere along the course of a, a child or, or rare epilepsy uh, with a child along their journey, there may be issues, uh, something is happening, a funny spell, is it a seizure, should I be treating it, should I not be treating it? 
Is it a behavioral event? Um, figuring out what's a seizure, what's not a seizure, confirming a syndromic diagnosis, as I discussed before, and determining whether a child might be a candidate for a device or a surgery. I will remind you, and this is basically making uh, not video EEG, but video monitoring more equitable across the community because video EEG monitoring is very expensive and it can only be carried on for so long. But people are now realizing, and this is the name of an article that was actually uh, published, the value of smartphone videos for diagnosis of seizures. Everyone owns half an epilepsy monitoring unit in their pocket. So um, it is very important as part of care, if you see an event and you don't know what it is, then try and get a video of, it, video of it and show it to your doctor. And finally, I'm gonna transition to transition. Um, the pediatric neurologist or the pediatric epileptologist uh, has a far greater proportion of patients with various rare epilepsies and developmental epileptic encephalopathies and therefore has a comfort with those, has a comfort with the treatments that go along with them, um, also has greater access to behavioral therapists, social workers, and other important paraprofessionals. So um, when uh, someone is, you know, sort of a, a used to going to a pediatric epilepsy center uh, and then has to transition to an adult epilepsy center, they may feel a little bit um, bereft because all of the things, you know, the warm hugs that were around them are no longer there. Um, and, you know, maybe they don't uh, resemble all the other people that are in the waiting room quite as much. Um, in addition, pediatric neurologists, I'm just going to tell you, are more willing to provide care for the comorbidities that go along with the rare epilepsies, such as behavioral issues, drooling, GI issues, whereas the adult epileptologist who doesn't deal with those things on a regular basis may say, oh, go to your primary care doctor for that. And the primary care doctor may not be uh, that excited about taking care of them either. So these are issues, and I'm not saying I have an answer to them. I'm just telling you to know what to expect. So people talk a lot about transition, transition clinics, um, what are the best practices for what happens, and why do you even need to transition? Why can't you just see your pediatric epileptologist forever? Well, you know, if a child becomes ill, or now that they're an adult, if they become ill, they're gonna have to be admitted to an adult hospital, and there needs to be somebody who knows how to care for them there. The ideal situation, I'm very fortunate to have this at my institution, is when pediatric and adult epileptologists provide care side by side. That isn't always available, but transition is optimal under other circumstances when there is really good transfer of information from the pediatric to the adult provider. So in conclusion, achieving best care for rare epilepsies really does take a village. It's important to advocate on behalf of you or your loved one's care. Continue to advocate, and I know you know that. Make sure there's a syndromic diagnosis at the very least and a causative diagnosis if it is at all possible and understand that they are not the same thing. And seek specialist care, and this means an epileptologist if at all possible. Thank you so much for your attention and sorry about the coughing fit. Dr. French, what an excellent uh, just presentation and the breadth of your presentation. We really appreciate you being uh, here with us. We're going to get into some of the questions that were in the chat and hoping you'll be able to answer. We're running ahead of schedule, uh, but being mindful of your time. One of the questions that I see is uh, uh, related to the, the genes and the DNA testing component. The question is, when did they find DNA or genes to be critical and attached to uh, the epilepsy journey? And, and, and can you talk about that evolution? It seems like uh, the questioner is just uh, harking back to 1974 of uh, BX, I guess is, is just the short phrasing, but uh, I don't have any other context just to ask Ben. Can you talk about genetic testing and 
maybe even what it looks like to think about it retrospectively, uh, where you may have been in the unknown category and advances and innovation. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I will tell you from my perspective, I have been an epileptologist for over 30 years. And I can tell you for a fact that when we, when I started as an epileptologist, there were just a few genes that we knew about. And we even only knew about, you know, uh, uh, one of the most fascinating stories, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, uh, is Dravet syndrome. Because everybody knew there was a Dravet syndrome. And thank goodness to Charlotte Dravet, who's still alive, who first recognized that several of the children um, sitting in her waiting room had similarities in, in their gait and in the way they presented with seizures and seizure clusters. And she identified that these belonged in a syndrome. But it wasn't until 20 years later that we found out that Dravet syndrome was actually very specifically associated almost always, not always, but almost always, with one particular gene, which is SCN1A. So um, I will tell you, and, and I'm not proud to say this, but there, there are people that I took care of when I was early in my career uh, that never got genetic testing, and now they're adults, and they have Dravet syndrome. And we know that when you go to an adult clinic, um, in fact, I've been having discussions about this because we know that some of those children who, who go sort of non-diagnosed with a syndrome and they just are told they have a developmental epileptic encephalopathy, um, those children could actually benefit from the same drugs that are given to young children, such as stiropentol uh, and fenfluramine. So, you know, we need to go back as adult epileptologists and we look at every child and, and um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you another story of um, a young lady who uh, almost had epilepsy surgery at, uh, at my center because she, she was an adult with very severe epilepsy. Um, and when her mother told me, you know, like her mother came in literally with, you know, seven tall books of her history. And when I started to go through it, I'm like, oh, she had febrile seizures and she had very prolonged seizures. You know, I wonder if she has a genetic disorder. And sure enough, she had an SCN1A mutation. Uh, that spared her from having a surgery that, that probably was not going to work for her. And actually, we managed to get her on medication and she's now seizure free. So good end to that story. Well, and that's, that's, that's really good because it leads into the next question that was uh, asked, which is, uh, how often would you recommend, even in the discussion, maybe folks have been elevated from a neurologist to an epileptologist from maybe their uh, primary care up to the next level of care, and they're thinking about genetic testing and the timing. Uh, how often should they be thinking about genetic testing? Uh, do you only recommend it where folks are sitting in the bucket of not yet known? Can you talk more about how you've advised even your colleagues about how to move along the genetic testing conversation. Yeah, I mean, there's gonna be, by the way, I'm gonna tell you guys, there's gonna be a whole talk on genetics, on genetics later on in this uh, symposium. So you guys should listen to that one. Um, but if you have you know, a genetic diagnosis, then that's the end, that should be the end of the odyssey, right? You have your answer. If you don't, then you should continue to seek it, right? Now, this is a conversation, you know, it has to do with trust with your epileptologist. You know, if you have a good epileptologist, then that epileptologist can help guide. Yes, it makes sense to continue to look for a genetic, and we have a better test now. Or, you know, we're up to where we, you know, could possibly be, and we can't do any more right now. That doesn't mean that two years from now you shouldn't ask again, you know. Because, you know, quite honestly, the, the neurologist, epileptologist may not always have in top of mind every time they see that child, oh, when was the last time I did genetic testing? And oh, did something happen since then? So it's always good, as I said, to advocate, advocate, advocate. Earlier, you talked about the uh, studies related to B6, vitamin B6, and there was a question about what that recommendation uh, is looking like, in particular with intractable uh, seizures. 
can you talk more about what that study was looking at and, and what folks might consider with their doctor and their care team? Yeah, I mean, the, the B6 deficiencies are epilepsies that start in, in, in extreme infancy. So you don't have to worry about that genetic defect later on, you know, with, with, with epilepsies that begin after, I mean, not infancy, newborn, really, after newborn. Uh, vitamin B6 may be given, you know, people like to give it for, you know, uh, adverse effects of other medications and other reasons, but it's probably not going to be, be correcting your epilepsy. But some people do still give it. Um, so you should, you know, definitely talk to your, to your uh, epileptologist about that. Dr. French, we have a few more minutes and I want to transition to talk about the, the state of care and thinking around the context of therapies for everyone. And you gave the really important tip early on and then reinforced the syndromatic diagnosis being needed and important. I was wondering, as you started to talk about syndromes and underlying causes, and, and, and I would love to hear you talk more about the gaps in getting to the point where you're working to warm syndrome and then starting to think about the underlying causes. Can, can you give a sense of around what the research or the discussions are about gaps? And, and, and I think I, I took a note that it was beyond folks that live beyond 50 miles of a specialist. I'm wondering if it's really about the geographic disparities uh, in people's journey, but if you can talk more about any that you know in research that is just proven uh, uh, to be building barriers for folks uh, in, in moving along their uh, diagnostic odyssey. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a tough one because you can get a syndromic diagnosis and it can be incorrect also. Mm. Um, mm. If, if you get a correct syndromic diagnosis, that often, but not always, will you know, reduce the number of things that a doctor has to think about in terms of what caused this. But there are some, and Lennox Gesto is a perfect example, where there are so many different things that could cause it. It really doesn't limit the causes at all. And you just have to start from square one, even, you know, as if you didn't have a syndrome. And, um, you know, just, just make sure that you check all the boxes of the different things that can cause it. Um, but, you know, I, I am absolutely convinced that, you know, if you could draw a map, which we, we can't, but if you could draw a map um, at distance from, you know, epilepsy centers, the number of people would have, who would have correct syndromic and causative diagnoses would drop, drop, drop. You mm -hmm. know, nobody's done that study, but right. I'm sure it's true. You know, yeah. this is why, and I'm just going to, you know, like this isn't the, the forum for this, but, but you know that we at the Epilepsy Center are trying to create this platform called Eden, mm -hmm. which is to try and get people to connect to the Epilepsy Center through a platform. And one of the things that we ask them is, what type of epilepsy do you think you have? So we, we have 350 people on the platform right now, and I haven't looked at the data, but I am going to be fascinated to see whether people have any idea because I have, you know, a, a strong feeling that most people will not be able to say, they'll check the box that says, I don't know what syndrome I have. Mm. And if mm. you're going to do your own research about what is possible, then you should have a syndromic diagnosis. Yeah. Wow. That, listen, talk about tips and breakthroughs and a call to action, right? To your <laughs> point. The Epilepsy Foundation has invested in building systems that can start to help us give us insights into folks who are, uh, as we talk about in Minnesota, living in the geographic and cultural and economic margins of society, right? And some of the balance for us is to be thinking far and wide about how do we get people towards, as you talk about this diagnostic odyssey, having a syndromatic diagnosis and, and what the power of that is. Can you talk a little bit about also um, any recommendations about, I know you highlighted the foundation has a spot where you focus on clinical trials that people should be considering. Are there other ways that folks should be navigating the clinical trials discussion or their uh, willingness to uh, 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 get to the best team possible? Can you just give us some, some of those basic thoughts? Or, or, and I was hinging on your point around clinical trials. Uh, and I was thinking this has to be a barrier that most people just don't know 
how to and where to navigate to, to, to know their possibilities. It's so true. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times, and this is very strange because here you are in Chicago, where I get a call from somebody in Chicago saying, mm. I got your name from a friend as, you know, you, you know something about epilepsy. And can I come see, can I fly to New York to see you? And I'm like, do you know that there are people who know something about epilepsy in Chicago and they have no idea? Yeah. Yes. Um, so um, th this is, you know, this is critical. I mean, if, you know, in, in uh, I, you know, and I'm going to turn, flip this one back to you too. I believe mm. that, you know, the, the epilepsy, um, uh, you know, all of the regional epilepsy uh, groups like yours have resources on your websites to tell you how to get to the epilepsy centers. Now, getting an appointment at the epilepsy center, that may be something else, but you know, you gotta, you gotta try, you gotta yes. try. Yes. And, and that's an excellent point because, you know, one of the balances that I know you have championed and uh, our, our colleague Aisha talks about often uh, with your leadership is, is that the encouragement for the medical providers and folks that work in public health on the ground in local communities have to be each other's advocates for our community, especially when folks are sitting in that bucket of uh, not yet known, right? Uh, and around this diagnostic odyssey and, and the importance there. Uh, I wanna make sure that I'm not missing any other questions that have uh, popped up, uh, but I do want to maybe uh, ask one or one or two more questions. And, and the one I'm thinking about is in the transition to adult care, are there things that um, patients and caregivers should be thinking about when they are advocating for that transition? One of the things that I've heard is, the 18 year old is expected to be able to walk in, right? And have uh, a full context to their pediatric journey. But we know that, that that's the caregiver that has carried most of the information there. Uh, how have you seen folks successfully navigate that transition? And what, are, what would be, you know, maybe the point is, is that should we be having beyond the rescue plan, a very clear one pager around the sim, a sim dramatic diagnosis and, maybe even the care track, where they have gone and who they have worked with. Just, just your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I'm going to take that one back to the, <laughs> to the, mothership, <laughs> to the mothership, right? <laughs> to the mothership. But, um, you know, uh, again, this is another reason why we developed Eden is because it, it is to give you an idea of the journey, right? Mm. So it, it includes all of the drugs that you've taken and because i mean i can tell you even you know as an adult epileptologist when people come in transitioning because it's not only transition from you know a pediatric to an adult but from one adult epileptologist or one adult neurologist to another um and i ask them what drugs they failed and why you know mm. it, it, it's um it's amazing to me how First of all, people can't name the drugs they've been on often, so it's important to keep that list, but also to keep the list of why that failed, because it may be that it's worth retrying that drug. You know, if it, it didn't fail for, you know, safety reason, maybe the dose wasn't high enough. So, you know, keeping the highest dose is also important. Mm -hmm. um, getting the medical records is a little easier now because we have electronic medical records that, um, uh, different hospital systems can sometimes access records from another hospital system, but not always, right? But I think your idea of getting the essentials of what you need to have and having a parent, you know, continually maintain that or prepare it in preparation for going on to uh, an adult center would be fantastic. Well, and you know, uh, the, the number of folks, as we know, our pediatric population is where most, you know, half of our diagnoses onsets take place, but the size of population that they grow into is the overwhelming uh, majority of folks living with epilepsy. And this transitional uh, moment uh, is critical uh, and leads into, uh, frankly, some of the highest risk cases in epilepsy. Uh, I, I, I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't want to delve a little bit deeper into Eden. Uh, you have not only touched on it a little bit, uh, but I believe you've offered some inspiration today in ways that I haven't heard us talk about before. So I wanna just drill in and ask you, 
give us the high level why this matters at the local level that we are connecting to Eden that is not just a national movement, but it is much more individual uh, self-responsibility and opportunity to take ownership of your navigation and your journey. Please, I, I love the promotion, uh, yeah. Dr. French, because I, you have inspired me just in hearing you talk about it, but I feel like we haven't maybe even navigated in the ways you've discussed in its direct connection to areas like rare epilepsies or geographic uh, and rural health. Uh, so please, uh, yeah. your and pitch. It, and it's, it's in its infancy. I just want to, um, you know, emphasize that, you know, in my, in my greatest, you know, dreams, yes. I see it growing and maturing over time and offering more and more opportunities over time. But yeah. the idea in its fundamental essence is that it gives somebody a way to navigate and track over time, not only their seizures, but the side effects of medication, what medications they've taken. Um, it allows you to actually suck in your medical records from multiple different types of systems. So that can help when you transition over, right? Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, and people have to buy into this, um, that information gets your name, date of birth, and everything that can identify you erased from it. And mm -hmm. it becomes a journey mm -hmm. that we can then learn from along with thousands of other journeys. Yes. Yes. So that we can say, where are the problem points? And you know, how can we help people navigate those problem points? And how many people, you know, one thing that I, you know, I am aching to learn from Eden is, you know, here are people, you know, because we ask them the first thing they come on the on the platform, who takes care of you? Is it a primary care doctor? Is it a neurologist? Is it an epileptologist? We also ask them. Do you have a rescue plan? Um, we ask how many drugs have been tried. So imagine this gets really right to your point. Mm -hmm. um, if we find that in a decade, if you're out in the general with a general neurologist, they've tried two drugs, but an epileptologist has tried ten drugs, right? Mm -hmm. um, imagine if you know the general neurologist doesn't give a rescue plan. The mm -hmm. epileptologist does give a rescue plan. So. There are so many ways that we can find out about those disparities, and then we can know where to put our efforts to address them. Well, uh, we will be talking more about how to bolster Eden's engagement. Uh, and, and as we can be early adopters and first adopters in the upper Midwest, uh, it is because of this moment that uh, I believe you have inspired many of us to be thinking about how we can help deploy and get this started in its first generation and forward. Dr. French, we want to thank you so much for being with us this morning at the Upper Midwest Rare Epilepsies Conference. It's been an inspiring talk to continue to think about the syndromatic diagnosis and the diagnostic odyssey, and we so appreciate your time this morning. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Session at 1045 is Managing Neuropsychiatric and Cognitive Comorbidities in Epilepsy. Today, we will be listening uh, and discussing the burden of comorbidities or coexisting conditions, uh, which is high for people with epilepsy. We're going to learn about some of the cognitive and mental health challenges that can be presented for both children and adults and take away some helpful tools and resources that can benefit you and your loved ones. Uh, with that, today we welcome uh, Dr. Nicole Williams uh, Doonan, uh, who is a neurologist at Gillette Children's Specialty Care here in Minnesota. We're so glad to have uh, Dr. Doonan with us today, as well as Dr. Erica Siege, uh, neuropsychologist uh, from Northwestern Medicine. Uh, finally, we will hear from Christy Cargill. Uh, who is a parent of a child with a rare epilepsy. She's a mom, a caregiver, and an advocate. Uh, we look forward to a strong discussion across presentations. Once again, uh, please be able to uh, review uh, and as you listen to drop in your Q&A question. And we look forward to a really strong discussion today. I believe we will hear, be hearing from Dr. Nicole Williams uh, Doonan first. Uh, then Dr. Erica Siege, and then Christy Cargill. 
Uh, but if I have that order wrong, it's 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 my fault. Dr. Doonan, are you on with us uh, this morning? Uh, and if so, please, we, we'd love to have your presentation. Okay, great. Um, so I will share my screen here. I do not use Zoom very much. So please let me know if you can hear me. I can hear you. You you are live. Okay, great. And I've never used this um, uh, closed captioning feature, but hopefully that's going to work uh, well for us here today. So um, thank you so much to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to talk on this important topic of cognition and epilepsy. As you guys have heard, I'm a pediatric neurologist at Gillette Children's in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. So my specialty is in the care of uh, infants, children, and adolescents, though I did try to include some information that will be relevant for adults as best I could. You guys, this was a huge amount of information to try to cover a given 20 minutes. I will try not to go over, and I hope that in trying to review so much information that there's actually something useful within uh, the topics uh, that I've chosen to cover for us today. Um, and just one more thing is my background is that I do take care of uh, children with uh, pretty complex and at times severe neurological uh, disabilities, including many, many children with epilepsy, including rare epilepsies, and uh, many children with intractable epilepsy. So that is uh, my point of view coming to you today. Dr. Dr. Dugan, before Dunin, before you keep going, uh, you, your your slides aren't up, and so I want to make sure that you up. have a chance to just press the share screen button at the bottom. Oh, uh, thank you very much because I thought they were up. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Okay. Oh, share. I see. I skipped a step. It's okay. We all do it from time to time, <laughs> and then if you can go to presentation mode, then we're good to go. Thank you. Yes, please. Okay, now are we good to go? We're good to go. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, now we go. I'm just going to have to minimize my video so I can see my screen. Perfect. Okay. All right. Now, uh, so the objectives I'm hoping to cover today are to demonstrate to you how cognitive impairments and mental health disorders are an integral component of an epilepsy diagnosis. Uh, I want to go over what cognitive symptoms uh, individuals might experience or complain about, uh, in, uh, and then identify factors that influence cognition in uh, people with epilepsy. So this is going to be the bulk of the talk, uh, and then try to address some treatment and interventions for cognitive symptoms in individuals with epilepsy. So first, I want to just briefly go over a definition of epilepsy. Sorry, I've got the video. Oh, there we go. Okay. So as everyone here knows, epilepsy is defined by the presence of seizures. And over the last several years, we really recognize that epilepsy is a disease of abnormal brain networks. So uh, this puts people at risk for having seizures, but abnormal brain networks can also cause cognitive disorders and psychiatric disorders. So we now recognize cognitive and psychiatric disorders as essential comorbidities of a diagnosis of epilepsy. I want to point out uh, that this is further shown by the fact that many comorbidities in epilepsy have a bi-directional association. That means if you have epilepsy, you have an increased risk for having a number of different comorbid conditions. And some of these same comorbid conditions put individuals at risk for developing future seizures in epilepsy. We also see that in some patients, an increased frequency of seizures or uncontrolled seizures puts them at risk for having a greater severity or more pro problematic comorbid uh, symptoms. And uh, the reverse is true in individuals with more severe comorbid conditions, they are potentially more at risk for worsening uh, seizure control and epilepsy. And for some patients, uh, many of you understand that the comorbid condition may be more problematic and create a greater impact or negative impact on the quality of life uh, more than seizures themselves, which is why this is our topic today. So um, I wanted to review some cognitive symptoms. Again, these are things that people with epilepsy may complain about or that their caregivers or uh, clinicians uh, may uh, pick up on. So memory complaints are very common. 
as well as uh, difficulties with focus and attention. Some patients may experience slow processing speed, word finding difficulties, other speech and language problems, general fatigue and sleepiness, and this may uh, really relate to a cognitive fatigue, developmental delay or regression in developmental milestones, academic uh, problems that may be uh, global in all of school or specific to certain subjects. Uh, in older individual, individuals, there may be difficulties with a regression in activities of daily living, um, and non-adherence or confusion about a treatment plan. These are things that uh, will trigger us to look into possible underlying cognitive difficulties, as well as um, difficulties with an individual providing a clear history or vocational problems. So these may be symptoms that are present at the onset of seizures or diagnosis of epilepsy. Uh, and, and these may be symptoms that uh, uh, emerge uh, along the course of it, the illness of epilepsy. So I want to spend the bulk of my talk going over potential causes of cognitive symptoms, because when we know what the cause is of the symptom, then we can try to address it specifically. So the first will be etiology of epilepsy. Secondly, I'll spend a little time talking about global developmental impairments and intellectual disability in epilepsy, touch on specific cognitive deficits in epilepsy, the impact of uncontrolled seizures, seizure medication adverse effects, poor sleep, ADHD, and depression and anxiety. And so what I'm really hoping to emphasize here is that yes, there are um, cognitive uh, impairments, cognitive disabilities that are present in many people with epilepsy. And then there are, uh, there's the impact of seizures in epilepsy and the treatment of, of epilepsy that can cause cognitive symptoms. And that it, it's super important to identify these comorbid conditions that uh, may be treatable and uh, can be causing a significant impact in an individual's uh, cognitive uh, function on a daily basis. So for the etiology of epilepsy, uh, I'm talking about uh, whether or not somebody may have an underlying genetic syndrome or structural brain abnormality that puts them at risk for both epilepsy and cognitive disability. So um, evaluations to be done, if not already done, either at the onset or diagnosis of epilepsy, or if there are new uh, cognitive symptoms that come along in the course of epilepsy would be to do further genetic testing, if not already done. And again, for new symptoms, consider a repeat brain MRI. For an example, in mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, we see progressive thinning of the neocortex uh, which can be seen on MRI and is associated with a decline in memory, uh, confrontational naming, and fine motor function. And treatment uh, for cognitive uh, difficulties related to the underlying diagnosis, well, there's going to be uh, limitations here, but uh, there is exciting research being done on uh, particularly genetic conditions where we hope in the future there may be some precision therapies uh, available to target both seizure control and the cognitive uh, uh, disabilities that go along with these conditions, which is why uh, genetic diagnosis is, or one reason why genetic diagnosis is so important. I wanted to go over um, global uh, developmental impairments and intellectual disability and how that interacts with epilepsy diagnosis. So briefly, intellectual disability is a condition where individuals have limitations in both intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior. We know that people with epilepsy have a risk for intellectual disability. One in four children with epilepsy will be diagnosed with intellectual disability and risk factors for intellectual disability in children with epilepsy include younger age of seizure onset and the presence of daily seizures. Likewise, again, trying to highlight the bi-directional relationship between some uh, epilepsy comorbidities, uh, we see, know that uh, individuals with intellectual disability are at higher risk for developing epilepsy. So it's been reported that one in five individuals with intellectual disability will be diagnosed with epilepsy and that this risk increases with the severity of intellectual disability with some reports. Uh, stating that about 50% of those with profound intellectual disability will have seizures and epilepsy. Additionally, if you have a combination of intellectual disability and cerebral palsy, that increases your risk factor, risk for epilepsy. 
And I wanna highlight that the combination of epilepsy and intellectual disability uh, together is a risk factor for later dementia. Now I wanna talk about specific cognitive impairments that can be seen in individuals with epilepsy. Often these are present, again, at the time of diagnosis, speaking to the fact that epilepsy is a brain disease of abnormal networks causing cognitive issues and seizures. So, and I want to importantly point out that individuals with well-controlled epilepsy and normal IQ can still have specific cognitive deficits. And uh, some examples may include difficulties with attention, executive function, memory, language, or visual motor tasks. And again, I want to highlight that dementia is commonly associated with epilepsy and seizures. Evaluations that uh, could be done to further investigate whether or not there is a specific cognitive impairment in an individual or uh, potentially uh, dementia in, in older individuals would be uh, for adults, there are some standardized uh, or, or sorry, validated screening tests available that can be given in a neurology clinic or primary care clinic. Um, we don't have these uh, for children, um, but for all individuals, if there is a concern about a specific cognitive impairment, neuropsychology evaluation would be indicated. So uh, uncontrolled seizures can also have a significant impact on cognition. Uh, for some individuals, ongoing seizures can cause permanent and progressive changes in brain structure and connectivity. It's been well documented that in some individuals, um, the time before a seizure and the time after seizure, a uh, person can uh, experience significant disruption in their behavior and functioning that could be up to 24 hours before and after. So for a person that is having daily seizures or multiple seizures per week, there's very little time uh, in between these periictal periods where somebody might be at their best uh, function. And then there are the epileptic encephalopathies where we believe that the interictal epileptic discharges are causing a direct impact on cognitive function and treating the interictal epileptic discharges may be important to try to improve cognitive outcome. So uh, this is why it's important to treat uncontrolled seizures in the ways that we know can be done. So a very important uh, cause of uh, cognitive dysfunction uh, are, med are seizure medications. So this makes sense because seizure medications act on neural networks and therefore they can um, exacerbate underlying cognitive problems that are already there and unfortunately can create new cognitive problems. It is the number of anti-seizure medications that is the biggest predictor of cognitive uh, problems. Uh, but I also wanna point out that depression symptoms um, are a very significant um, contributor to cognitive um, symptoms. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Additional risk factors for cognitive side effects related to seizure medications are the medications that are older and topiramate specifically. Also high dose of seizure medications are gonna put individuals more at risk for cognitive side effects. A neuropsychology evaluation can be very helpful when it's not totally clear if the symptoms are related to medication or uh, to another comorbid condition or um, underlying cognitive deficit. Sleep, as we all know, is extremely important and sleep disorders are very common in individuals with epilepsy. Here I have listed several different uh, disorders or problems that children with epilepsy may experience. So I'll just read them here, sleep anxiety, insomnia, excessive arousals, reduced REM, uh, obstructive and or central sleep apnea, and, uh, daytime sleepiness. Uh, I wanna point out that psychiatric conditions like anxiety and depression can cause poor sleep. Seizure medications can affect sleep, either causing daytime sleepiness or directly causing insomnia, specifically with lamotrigine or felbamate. So when there are sleep disorders present, it uh, depends on you know, what all is going on with the patient, whether or not a person may be best served by a referral to sleep medicine, psychiatry, psychotherapy, or perhaps an adjustment to seizure medication. ADHD is also a very common comorbidity in epilepsy that can impact somebody's cognition. In children with epilepsy, ADHD prevalence is reported as high as 77. 
Again, we see a bi-directional relationship, meaning individuals with epilepsy are at higher risk for developing epilepsy than individuals without ADHD. And again, individuals with epilepsy are at higher rates of developing ADHD compared to individuals without epilepsy. In the ADHD uh, symptoms that uh, patients have, persons have uh, in epilepsy tend to be more the inattentive uh, symptoms uh, rather than hyperactivity and impulsivity. Of course, those symptoms can still be present. Some seizure medications can make ADHD worse or kind of mimic in ADHD. I have mentioned here phenobarbital to pure make valproate, but honestly, I would say any seizure medicine could do this. And again, this is a comorbid condition that's extremely important to diagnose um, so that it can be treated. Um, a diagnosis may be done through a rating scale where um, parents, caregivers, individuals with epilepsy, teachers uh, will check off um, the presence or absence or severity of symptoms related to ADHD. Um, I tend to prefer a neuropsychology evaluation to diagnose ADHD because uh, there are so many different factors at play uh, and uh, this is a more reliable um, way to proceed. Treatment can be through a primary care provider, neurologist, psychiatrist, developmental or behavioral pediatrician. I mean, treatment is with medication and uh, though for some individuals, environmental or behavioral interventions are have listed here a couple of uh, websites that I see our psychologists at Gillette giving to patients when they are diagnosed with ADHD, and, and these could be great resources for you. Um, for psychiatric disorders, um, as I've already mentioned, um, they're very common in individuals with epilepsy. Uh, it is said that one in three people with epilepsy will have a lifetime diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder, and for example, about a third of children at the onset of seizures will have um, some depressive or anxiety symptoms. There are uh, some psychiatric conditions listed here that um, put people at risk for developing epilepsy, including major depression, ADHD, autism, and psychotic conditions. And it's been shown in research that uh, through neuroimaging studies that some of the mental health or psychiatric conditions do have shared network abnormalities with epilepsy. So it is important um, to identify uh, uh, the possibility of uh, anxiety or depression in individuals with epilepsy through standardized screening and clinic visits. Uh, and if there is a concern for anxiety or depression, a referral um, may be indicated either to psychiatry or psychotherapy, medications may be prescribed. I also often refer my patients for a neuropsychology evaluation if it's not totally clear if there is anxiety or depression, especially in children, symptoms of anxiety and depression could mimic other um, uh, conditions such as ADHD uh, or um, uh, learning disabilities or cognitive um, difficulties. So I wanted to touch briefly on neuropsychology, even though I know we have a neuropsychologist in our panel today. So uh, because I've mentioned it several times here. So neuropsychology is the study of the relationship between brain function and cognition, emotion, and behavior. The goals of the neuropsychology assessment are to evaluate epilepsy, the underlying cause of epilepsy, the frequency of seizures, the history of seizures, treatment of seizures, put this all together with the developmental history, intrinsic factors like age, um, other demographics, genetic background of a, of a person, uh, together with um, the cognition profile, as well as looking at psychological and behavioral factors and other social factors. Um, and these factors are all uh, collected through an interview and comprehensive psychometric assessment. And then here I have listed just some of the neurocognitive domains that might specifically be included in a neuropsychology assessment, looking at language, learning, memory, um, motor function, executive function. The results of a neuropsychology evaluation will provide diagnoses such as potentially um, a global uh, diagnosis uh, of intellectual disability or potential specific dysfunction and executive function or specific learning disabilities and may provide a diagnosis of comorbid conditions such as anxiety or ADHD. And the treatment and interventions that come from this are critical. So um, examples may include a referral to speech or occupational therapy, psychotherapy, referral to other medical specialists outside of neurology, 
um, guidance for an IEP or 504 plan. Uh, there may be a recommendation about changing seizure medications um, or cognitive rehabilitation. So I don't know if Dr. Siege is going to talk about cognitive rehabilitation, but in trying to give you some information about treatment of cognitive dis disabilities or deficits in epilepsy, I wanted to include this here. So um, cognitive rehabilitation is an approach to address neuropsychological deficits and the framework is as such. Step one is to optimize seizure control and um, treat uh, comorbid psychiatric conditions. Step two is to provide education to an individual with epilepsy and or their caregivers about seizures, the underlying pathology of epilepsy, specific cognitive uh, deficits, and to really go into detail about how cognition and seizures um, uh, interplay with one another. This education in and of itself can sometimes reduce anxiety in caregivers and people with uh, uh, epilepsy. And the third step is training in specific cognitive techniques. One approach um, to, uh, proposed by Dr. Baxendale is this SOS toolbox where S is um, developing strategies to address the cognitive deficits that are internal. O is outsourcing using calendars, smartphone apps, text reminders, regular online orders, other social media uh, to help um, accommodate for deficits that are present. And S importantly is the social support of loved ones, uh, teachers, colleagues around you um, to help support uh, where needed. Lastly, I wanted to discuss a special uh, kind of under the um, thought that this provides um, intervention and treatment for cognitive uh, uh, issues in children with epilepsy. Uh, and sometimes people are confused about an IEP for, versus a 504 plan, so I wanted to address that briefly. So an IEP um, is what provides special education. It's a written plan that the school must adhere to. Uh, and to uh, be eligible for an IEP, students must qualify for one or more of 13 disabilities. And these disabilities or conditions must impact school performance. Uh, a 504 plan is for children that don't qualify for special education, but have an, a disability that um, interferes with uh, one or more basic life activity. Uh, 504 plans aren't always in writing, but they typically are. Um, so I uh, stole this uh, chart from Pacer Center, which is an organization in Minnesota that provides a lot of education to families and advocacy around uh, education for individuals with uh, disabilities. Uh, and so uh, I don't know if you can see, but at the very top, you have a child with a learning need and uh, the parent or uh, maybe another professional with parent approval will request um, either an IEP or a 504 plan. Uh, so on the left side is uh, the way to go for IEP and on the right is 504 plan. So I don't know the next slide. So on the left, if somebody is eligible for an IEP special education, you're gonna end up getting um, special um, design instruction and related services to make sure that the child has a free appropriate public education. In a 504 plan on the right here, um, mostly uh, individuals will have accommodations that then result in a free appropriate public education. So some educational resources, uh, I mentioned Pacer Center in Minnesota and each state has an organization, one or two, which provides um, support. Um, they are called parent training and information centers or community parent resource centers and you can look them up on parent org, or I have them listed here. I also found information about IEPs and 504 plans on the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota and understand.org. Uh, finally, I want to provide just some more general information on comorbidities and epilepsy. So for patients with epilepsy and caregivers, the epilepsy.com website uh, has a lot of great information about uh, diagnosing and managing comorbidities and epilepsy. And for clinicians, the American Epilepsy Society website has practice tools with a lot of great information. So in conclusion, I hope that I have shown you that cognitive difficulties are uh, common uh, in individuals with epilepsy and um, shown you that cognitive impairments uh, are uh, sometimes essential uh, in a 
in a component of an epilepsy diagnosis as well as psychiatric disorders. And to be able to provide holistic management of epilepsy, we must pay attention to specific cognitive impairments and also to all the comorbid conditions that we may be able to provide treatment for. Uh, and improved treatments are needed to address cognitive impairments in epilepsy uh, because much of the funding and research in epilepsy is really focused on seizures and very little money and research um, goes towards um, looking at cognition in epilepsy. So that is what I have for you today. Dr. Doonan, thank you so much. Uh, and we look forward to the Q&A. There were already a few questions that popped up. Uh, and so we look forward to uh, a chance uh, for you to uh, weigh in along with your other co-presenters. Uh, next, I wanna welcome uh, to the Upper Midwest Rare Epilepsy Conference, um, Dr. Uh, Zeig, I believe is that's how it's pronounced, Dr. Erica Zeig is a board certified clinical neuropsychologist at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, where she splits her time between the Department of Neurology and the Department of Psychiatry, uh, as well as uh, being a founding member of the Functional Neurologic Disorder Society uh, and is active in the epilepsy and movement disorders research space. Uh, Dr. Zeig, we're so glad to have you on this morning. Please uh, start your presentation. We look forward to hearing uh, so much more from you this morning. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate that very kind introduction. Um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak to everyone here. I'm just gonna share my screen and then I'm going to try to make sure that closed captioning is on. The instructions that were passed about in our little chat didn't quite match what I have on my screen. Um, not sure. I don't believe controlled captioning is on. Is that correct? I don't see it currently. It says it should be in the view section of the options available. It might show up when you um, do. Oh, when I change it to show. I have an option to turn on subtitles. That How about that? Be. Yes, there it is. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, You're good to great. go. I think every uh, computer and system is just a little different in terms of how it looks and when the options come up. So thanks for your patience, everyone. I claim to be a neuropsychologist, not an IT specialist, sorry. Um, but I'm so grateful for the opportunity to speak today. As um, I was introduced, I'm a neuropsychologist at Northwestern. Um, I think it's a good fit uh, between myself and Dr. Doonan because she focuses more on pediatrics and I focus a bit more on adults, um, but I do have some background in pediatrics as well. And it's a spectrum um, and issues in pediatrics often continue to be issues in adulthood. So I think it's, it's really important to be aware of all. Um, and I think our talks will hopefully be complementary. Um, I think we covered similar, um, but not overlapping topics. And so hopefully I can expand on some of the excellent um, already bits of information and recommendations that were provided. So I'm gonna start, I wouldn't be a neuropsychologist if I didn't start with a brain and I promise this is my only brain slide and I won't spend much time here. Um, I just wanted to highlight why, why there are coexisting challenges with epilepsy in the first place. You know, why does epilepsy even cause cognitive, psychiatric, or neurobehavioral changes? Um, and one of my mentors here at Northwestern, Marcel Meslam, he's, he's a brilliant behavioral neurologist, and I just appreciate the way he conceptualizes the brain and how that produces behavior and experience in our functioning. Um, and so I really like how he kind of breaks the brain down into five primary major networks um, that the brain has that creates a lot of our experience and a lot of our abilities. Um, and the two that are impacted most by epilepsy are the um, temporal and frontal lobes. Now the temporal lobes are the ones along the side here and the middle temporal lobes are actually in the inside of this fold 
So on the under view, you can see the inside of the temporal fold here is the middle temporal lobes. Um, and then the frontal lobes are at the front part of the brain here. And those are two areas that are really most commonly impacted by epilepsy, including rare epilepsies. Rare epilepsies, though, can sometimes have more of a global, um, more widespread um, impact on the brain. But a lot of epilepsies do have a predilection for the middle temporal lobes and frontal lobes. And then major networks in that brain region are memory. This nice memory network is in green here. And then um, the frontal lobes are responsible for um, working memory and executive uh, functions, as well as comportment. And comportment is behaviors, making sure we're behaving appropriately, making sure that we are abiding by social norms, that we're understanding the significance of what we're seeing and who we're interacting with, um, which is why some of the most common behavioral manifestations from epilepsies, but also rare epilepsies are memory disturbances, prominent memory disturbances can happen where people might be completely amnestic or forget things. Um, similar to a dementia syndrome because Alzheimer's disease actually impacts the same brain structures. Um, so it's the same symptom just for a different reason. And then frontal lobes, um, oh, sorry. And also in the, the memory um, and emotional network. So the temporal lobes also are very involved with emotional functioning. Um, it's where our experience of emotion is somewhat originating. Um, it's also where we process emotions, where we regulate our emotions. And the temporal and frontal lobes work very closely for regulating um, our emotions and our behaviors in response to what we remember and what we know. Um, so it's a very important, important um, networks for how we're able to navigate the world. The outer temporal lobes include language. Um, and, and our direct ability to use words and language to communicate if um, epilepsies involve more of the outer parts of the brain um, in the lateral regions like the language networks that that can really cause disruptions in, in explicit communication, which can have a whole host of issues. And the more um, top of the brain and back of the brain are more involved in visual spatial processing and spatial attention. Those are generally less impacted by rare epilepsies or um, epilepsies in general, but some can epilepsies that have a more global impact or if there's a focal issue like um, a tumor or a specific um, abnormality that starts and impacts the, the more back regions of the brain, it can impact visual spatial functioning. And that's more rare, so I focus a bit on some of the other elements. So with the rare epilepsies, there are, as I said, cognitive challenges, which Dr. Dunin did a great job covering, but there are also, as I noted, emotional challenges, behavioral challenges, and then that generally translate into daily functioning limitations. And so that's what I'm gonna talk more about today. So with rare epilepsies and epilepsies in general, outcomes can have such a wide range in terms of what people are able to do. It can range from mild to moderate to severe, but treatment and dedicated services for the cognitive as well as emotional or behavioral aspects of epilepsy and rare epilepsies are very uncommon. What I mean by that is that um, the, the services that are often used to treat these comorbidities are the ones that are used for other neurologic conditions, things like brain injury or stroke um, or more general neuro rehabs or um, more general emotional services or behavioral services. Um, so oftentimes people say, well, I need to see, I need to see a specialist in this. And unfortunately, there's epilepsy specialists, but then beyond that, for these other behavioral and cognitive challenges, it's very rare to have someone specialized in the cognitive and emotional challenges secondary to epilepsy. There's generally someone who specializes in cognitive or emotional challenges for a variety of reasons. Um, and that can really vary by geographic location, by hospital, by academic center, and providers can have a really wide range of knowledge about how specific um, conditions and aspects might relate to epilepsy or not. It might be some provider's area of expertise and it might not. And terminology can be very important um, when it comes to getting services or speaking with medical teams or um, even having services be covered. And um, there's a wide variety of terminology that can be considered. And you'll hear many, many things sort of uh, floated about by a variety of, of different providers and settings. Um, so as Dr. Dunin introduced neuropsychology, which was an excellent summary of kind of what we do and, and what our roles are, um, the terms that we tend to use, or not tend to, but are required to use based on our, 
our coding systems and our, our diagnostic manuals. Um, there's terms like major neurocognitive disorder, um, which relates to an acquired, meaning um, it, it was something that wasn't present before, an acquired thinking dysfunction um, that generally interferes with someone's ability to complete their daily tasks um, versus something like a neurodevelopmental disorder, which might be on the same scope or scale, but have been present the entirety of someone's life. Um, and brain injury is a vast umbrella term that can, can be considered when it's traumatic or new onset, but it can also occur from other medical causes like rare epilepsies. If someone's totally normal before, but then an onset of a rare epilepsy happens and their brain becomes damaged by the extent of seizures or epilepsy that's occurring, and now they acquire um, a brain injury from the extent of epilepsy that's happening, um, and they might have a brain injury and a major neurocognitive disorder. Interestingly, major neurocognitive disorder also covers dementias or dement, um, dementia syndromes. Um, and so it's kind of used interchangeably for a variety of reasons why someone's brain might no longer be working the way that it is. And as I noted um, in my prior slide, patients do often need to utilize more well-established resources for more common or general neurologic conditions like stroke, traumatic brain injury, dementia, or other neurodevelopmental conditions rarely are these services, excuse me, present just for epilepsy, but they are often highly, highly applicable and translatable. Now, this is where I kind of focus in on what can you do with any of the behavioral and um, cognitive challenges that might accompany epilepsies and rare epilepsies. Um, and there's, the good news is there's a large number of services that are available to help Oftentimes, I feel patients and family members just don't even know where to start. We as providers have access to all of these resources and know about them, um, but patients and families often don't. So I'm going to kind of walk through what each one of these different service organizations or, or service uh, arms might be able to help and contribute to the treatment and management of um, the cognitive and more psychiatric and behavioral comorbidities of um, epilepsies and rare epilepsies. Dr. Doonan did a great job of covering cognitive rehab. I only go into that briefly. So I think we're gonna kind of really nicely um, overlap and complement um, each other with these talks. So the first, I'm gonna briefly cover epilepsy team, although Dr. Doonan did a great job with that, as she noted, providing relevant um, continued medications, workups, um, safety protocols, health and safety protocols to use at home. So epilepsy and the epilepsy providers are obviously the first and foremost resource for managing epilepsy and associated conditions. But when it comes to other conditions, one of the next most important people when it comes to behavioral and cognitive aspects is a social worker. And generally most epilepsy divisions do have social work available. And social workers are so essential because they're knowledgeable of each of the available resources specific to someone's location. As I noted, services aren't the same across each setting, across each location, across each part of the country. And social workers are the unique person who have the knowledge to connect you with the resources that are available within your geographic location. Um, so they can help um, also with um, any of the referrals that a neuropsychologist might make or the epileptologist might make, they also might be able to help with establishing resources or connecting um, for support for financial burdens, um, as well as your hospital's Department of Financial Affairs, which can help with um, solutions and options because epilepsies and rare epilepsies can be very expensive conditions and put um, strains and burdens on families in a financial way that if those can be alleviated would just be um, so much more beneficial to everyone involved and also alleviate some source of stress and strain on families and patients. Um, social work can also help with ordering medications and physical equipment, um, and they are generally available at most hospitals and rehab centers, so, and some private agencies and organizations. If, if um, they're, they're sort of my first go-to for any, any help with establishing services. Now, the other thing that's often kind of commonly overlooked um, for individuals with epilepsies and rare epilepsies on, on a, a spectrum of severity is um, patients' legal means. Um, patients and families may already be aware of healthcare power of attorneys um, and stipulations during hospital stays, but sometimes further legal action is needed if a patient is at or beyond the age of legal adulthood and 
is no longer able to cognitively or neurobehaviorally make decisions that are appropriate or make decisions about their care. Um, sometimes guardianship is necessary, and oftentimes applying for and obtaining legal disability is necessary for a period of time with patients with epilepsy or rare epilepsies, or permanently depending on the nature and extent of the epilepsy and how severe it is. And that offers access to services, um, financial support, um, phys uh, physical assistance in the term of having a home health aid. Um, and so uh, legal disability is oftentimes an important resource for individuals um, when epilepsy is more severe. And um, social workers can generally connect um, with legal providers. Um, hospitals generally also have um, connections and recommendations for um, agencies that they generally work with or specific law firms that they work with that work specifically with medically, um, medically relevant um, conditions. Now, um, Dr. Adunin did cover a bit of rehabilitation, but I wanna cover um, a bit about who those providers are. So rehabilitation is over, often overseen by a physiatrist, a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor, PM and R specialist. Um, those doctors specialize in physical rehabilitation as well as cognitive re overseeing aspects of cognitive rehabilitation um, for a variety of things. Some, any major neurologic condition that can impact a person's ability to care for themselves. And it's generally um, designated to improve where possible an understanding of safety needs as well as implement safe um, and safety um, and activity changes that might help with a person's ability to execute their basic needs of daily living. Basic functionings like um, walking and talking and taking care of oneself, like using the bathroom and eating and getting dressed. Also higher order abilities like cognitive functions can be addressed through physical, through um, speech and language therapy or occupational therapy. Physical therapy is a bit self-explanatory, but depending on the level of severity um, or um, course of epilepsy, a variety of rehabilitation specialists may be used. And there's sort of two different ways that someone can get rehabilitation. There's kind of an inpatient rehabilitation model, which is generally for more severe cases, more moderate to severe injuries where more help is needed. Um, and then there's outpatient rehabilitation for individuals who have more mild to moderate needs and who might already be a little more functioning at home. Um, and these might be uh, more like the types of rehab that Dr. Dunin covered regarding cognitive strategies, kind of those SOS strategies for helping patients and their families um, improve their strategies for daily living. And the outpatient cognitive rehab model um, is where patients um, continue to stay at home, but as Dr. Uh, Dunin noted, um, try to incorporate strategies that make their abilities uh, within their home environment um, easier or better. Okay, um, I will briefly touch on neuropsychology, um, but Dr. Dunin did such a great job um, describing its nature and purpose. The only thing I'll add is sort of the timing of it. So sometimes neuropsych assessment can be available when people are hospitalized, but generally it's mostly completed um, after a person leaves the hospital or in an outpatient setting. Um, and it's often completed at yearly intervals or as needed determined after the first visit. So generally a first assessment is completed and then it might be repeated at a year or two to five year intervals, depending on the rate of change or the rate of needs. But generally it's not completed any more than once a year because otherwise tests lose their sensitivity. And oftentimes it's just not necessary. Now, neuropsychiatry is, um, can oftentimes confused with neuropsychology, um, but they are an excellent specialty that has a very different purpose. So neuropsychiatrists, um, so psychology versus psychiatry, psychiatry is a medical doctor who can prescribe medications and has medical training. Psychologists and neuropsychology are more the PhD academic doctorates who oversee specialized assessments as well as offer non-medical interventions like psychotherapy. But neuropsychiatrists, as I said, are the ones, are medical doctors who specialize in providing medications to support thinking, mood, and behavioral individuals who've had a range of neurologic illnesses. So they can help with medication to support rehabilitation and functioning, but they can't perform the comprehensive cognitive assessment. That's neuropsychologists. Sorry, I know it's repetitive. It's a bit splitting hairs, um, but it, it takes actually a lot of training to be able to do either. So it has to be divided among professionals. Um, and generally neuropsychiatrists can be consulted prior to someone leaving the hospital, which is great. 
Um, but sometimes um, they're also, but they're also very rare, uh, widely available in an outpatient setting. Um, and generally people follow up um, within every three to six months with a neuropsychiatrist in terms of monitoring how medications are working and medication changes. They're an excellent resource for improving um, thinking, supporting thinking, attention, um, for supporting sleep, for helping with mood or behavioral disturbances, um, and can be a wonderful um, resource for patients and families to help ease some of the symptom burden and often kind of underknown and underutilized, I think. Oh, the only difference between a, a neuropsychiatrist and a psychiatrist I will highlight is that neuropsychiatrists have specialty training for people with neurologic conditions versus general psychiatry that covers the whole gamut of psychiatric conditions and principles. So if possible, if um, at your institution to connect with anyone with more neuropsychiatric specialty um, would be great. Now, the other aspect that I highlight when it comes to the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to managing epilepsies and rare epilepsies is family and caregiver supports. The behavioral and emotional challenges and cognitive challenges can be such a range. Um, and that's why I didn't even sort of attempt to say what the behavioral or, or mood challenges could be. <clears throat> a tickle in my throat, sorry. Um, mainly because they can be so incredibly varied. One person could struggle with anxiety. One person could struggle with depression. One person might struggle with behavioral control and regulation. They might act inappropriately. They might say inappropriate things. They might make impulsive decisions. Um, so it really is so unique to each individual person, what they might struggle with and how it might impact their family and their family system. But oftentimes what is very consistent across epilepsies is that um, patients oftentimes struggle with this and their family members experience those impacts and just the impact of epilepsy or rare epilepsy on a family can be fairly significant. Again, it's a range, but generally proportional to the range of severity of the epilepsy. So more mild epilepsies can have generally, hopefully, a more mild impact on families, individuals and families and family systems but more moderate and severe epilepsies can have more moderate and severe impacts on individuals, families, and family systems. So family structures can change radically if a, a epilepsy onsets and is more severe or is a rare epilepsy that really debilitates an individual or change their functioning. Um, so adult children might now become dependent on parents. Parents might no longer be able to keep, take care of their young children. Um, and in these cases, family therapy is often indicated just to sort out these complexities and challenges and get additional strategies and support. Um, also, um, specifically related to psychotherapy, um, in addition to medications to support the neural networks that contribute to mood and behavioral dysfunction that are common in epilepsies and rare epilepsies, Psychotherapy can be very helpful to gain insight and process those changes, as well as devise some solutions and strategies. The most common that is recommended, that I would recommend is acceptance and commitment therapy or solutions focused therapy, because it basically focuses on accepting and adapting to what has occurred, generally something negative like epilepsy, which is undeniably a negative um, event or addition, um, but still focusing on um, being committed to value-based behavior, constructive and adaptive actions. So it really focuses on accepting any hardship that's happened in a realistic way, not wishing it away, not minimizing it, but more resiliently addressing what can be done that can be most helpful for individuals and their families. So I think that there are great therapeutic strategies that are um, able to help individuals who've been impacted by epilepsy and rare epilepsies as well. Um, but oftentimes people don't know to ask for it. They don't know that these resources are available, but which is why I kind of highlight um, it as something to specifically ask for. Social workers can definitely help finding psychologists or therapists or family therapists who use the specific modalities that might be mo most helpful. Um, so I really recommend, and that's why I led with social workers, because they can really help you find these resources within your community. I also want to um, discuss caregiver burnout and caregiver support, mainly because family members oftentimes help a lot depending on the level of severity of epilepsy with cognitive and behavioral problems. 
And caregivers oftentimes are so caught up in helping the patient, the individual um, with their issues that they forget to take care of themselves. They neglect their own doctor's appointments, they neglect their own health, um, but they oftentimes do need that extra support. Epilepsy is hard on the individual and it's hard on families. And depending on the severity, it can really be a team effort or a family effort that's needed. So I really encourage caregivers to have support, to reach out, um, to utilize support groups and all sort of available social governmental agencies and funds, um, and also planning ahead and having their own emotional outlets and support so that they're able to maintain health and wellness so that everyone can focus on um, managing the cognitive and behavioral complexities that accompany epilepsy and rare epilepsies. So just as um, the summary of my talk, I wanted to highlight that for individuals with epilepsies and rare epilepsies, um, patients and families are not alone in managing the cognitive and psychiatric limitations or challenges. And there's this whole big team of um, providers and agencies and services um, that can be utilized. Um, and I would really encourage everyone to try and utilize as many of these services as possible um, for any, any specific needs or concerns. Okay, and I will end my talk there. I think I'm just about at just over 20 minutes. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I look forward to any questions or um, any way that I can be helpful during the chat. Awesome, Dr. Zig. Thank you so much for that presentation. We look forward to the Q&A session. I know we already have some questions in the chat uh, and we expect more to pop up. Uh, with our third co-presenter, Christy Cargo, uh, who will talk about uh, her experiences as a mother, a caregiver, and an advocate. Once again, as we continue to talk about managing the neuropsychiatric and cognitive comorbidities in epilepsy, uh, Christy, want to welcome you this morning. You can cut on uh, your screen and uh, your mic and your presentation, and we look forward to hearing from you, and good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> right. All right. I am not, I've been a stay-at-home mom for 17 years now, so, and my husband is out of town, and he's the IT person, so I'm going to do my best here and see if I can get my presentation. Oh, let's see here. I click on share screen, correct? Yes. Yeah, let's see. Um, I don't see my presentation. Yep, right there in. Oh, all right. Maybe. Yeah, there was in your in your Chrome bar up above. Yeah, I gotta move this here. Let's see. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to it. Thank you. Great. Um, so I am Christy Cargo. I live in uh, Minnesota, and uh, we're in Stillwater. I've got um, a seventeen-year-old daughter named Emily. And she's our, um, our daughter that has a rare genetic disorder. And um, then we live with uh, my husband and my other daughter, Isabel, who's 14, and recently added a little kitten to our house. So we've got crazy like little toddler kitty and our dog, Tito. Um, so our, my, I guess what I'm here to share is our journey with rare epilepsy with our daughter. Um, as mentioned earlier, there was some talks about SCN1A, which is Dravet syndrome. Um, SCN2A is a newer genetic diagnosis um, that we actually didn't even get um, until Emily was much older. Let's see if I can, my slides are not switching here. There we go. Um, so Emily was born um, 38 weeks, which wasn't really a big deal. The um, the part that um, was important for um, having an emergency C-section was that I had no amniotic fluid left and she was breech. So she was born by emergency C-section. So other than that, we didn't have any indications that Emily was gonna have any sort of major challenges. Uh, the thought was that she actually had bacterial meningitis. Um, unfortunately, there was not any sort of spinal tap or anything done 
um, to confirm that, but the, um, the hospital she was born at did not have a NICU. They just had a neonatal nursery. And so they put her on broad spectrum antibiotics and at five days of life decided to transfer her to St. Paul Children's Hospital where she spent uh, the next 28 days in the NICU being treated for bacterial meningitis. Um, Emily had her first seizure, I would say within 12 hours after birth. Um, she was getting her first bath and um, proceeded to do a kind of a bicycling motion while the nurse was um, squeezing some warm water over her. My initial reaction was thinking that Emily was actually just, um, she, the water was too cold or too hot, uh, but she had us pull the um, emergency cord in the bathroom and push the nurse's button at the same time. Everybody came running in. Apparently that's like a big code whenever two buttons are pushed for the nurse's call, uh, the call button. And um, so Emily was whisked away, whisked away to the nursery and I didn't see her for several hours with no information about what was going on. Um, they later told us they suspected she was having seizures. They wanted to keep an eye on her. And eventually then, like I said, they transferred her at five days old to St. Paul Children's, which is when they did a um, spinal tap on her. But at that point, she had already been on broad spectrum antibiotics for three days. And so um, she wasn't able to um, culture anything, but based on her MRI and her CT of her brain, they thought her um, meninges of the brain and I'm not sure if that's even correct, <laughs> were um, inflamed. And so they said, we'll call it meningitis. We'll put her on the antibiotics at the end of 28 days. Then we will go ahead and um, uh, taper her off of any of the seizure medications that they put in place right away and things should get better. So we brought Emily home on Easter Sunday and um, it was a very horrible um, time at home. She seized pretty much nonstop. So the next day, Monday, we brought her into Gillette Children's. And after that, she spent the next three months at Gillette um, with lots and lots of blood tests, lots of urine tests, um, EEGs, MRIs, CTs, um, you name it. We, we were going through all the tests. In fact, she had so many tests in that three month period of time that she was actually given two different blood transfusions. Um, also during that early three month time, she was put in two different medically induced comas for status of her seizures. And just to show how ignorant I was to seizures, I was um, staying at the hospital because she's our firstborn and I had really nothing else to be doing but caring for her. And so um, when I was walking down the hallway early in the morning, one of the nurses asked me how Emily was doing. And I was like, well, she's in status. And in my mind, status meant stable and fine. Um, I didn't realize that status was related to status elepticus and she was, you know, that was why she was put in the medically induced coma was because her seizures were just not breaking. Um, I mean, I later learned that that's what that was, but I was in such a state of shock and completely oblivious to anything in the epilepsy world because we don't have any family members um, that have any sort of epilepsy. So I wasn't familiar with any, any of these terms. Um, and all of this was, you know, before she was three months old. And let's see here. Sorry, my slide is not moving. There we go. Um, fast forward to nine years later in life, um, after Emily had trialed more than 24 different medications, um, she had a, a vagal nerve implant. Um, we had it on for roughly three months. It did absolutely nothing for her seizures, unfortunately. Um, she tried the ketogenic diet. We tried so many different combinations of the medications she was on. Um, finally, at age nine, insurance decided that they were able to cover the whole exome, exome sequencing test, which at the time I believe was billed to insurance as $20,000. I'm not really sure what it's billed at now. Um, and um, finally, we got a hit, just one hit um, for Emily that pointed to her um, sodium channel and that she had a hit on her SCN2A gene that she had this, um, the G and the A flip-flopped, a tiny little microscopic change that seemed to cause such major um, trauma for her brain and, and little body. Um, at the time, the diagnosis was a major relief to me. Um, I stopped blaming myself for everything that I was doing during my pregnancy. 
or what I could have done better or what I, you know, what I missed in this and everything. And um, oddly, we already knew a family. I had met two different families that both had ch children with um, SCN2A. The first family I met randomly through um, another friend and the second family I met um, at the Minnesota State Capitol while we were campaigning for medical cannabis as a desperate plea for anything to stop Emily's seizures. Um, at that point in time, she was having roughly 1600 clinic seizures in a day. Um, and we just wanted to give her brain a break in any way, shape or form that we could. And unfortunately, those two girls, families that we met, they have both since passed away, which has been very hard because they were the first two families that we met um, related to this genetic diagnosis that we really felt um, there was going to be some hope for them. And we, we still are hopeful for SCN2A, um, but um, it just is really hard to <laughs> imagine the world without those two girls. Um, so what I've been kind of asked to talk about is kind of how I've navigated the system. And prior to finding out Emily's diagnosis, my way of navigating the system was actually to start my own support group. Um, oddly, I've heard the term SOS mentioned a couple of times in the last two presentations. And the name of our group is SOS. It's called Supporting Our Sanity. Um, it's a group of moms who all have kids that are um, Emily's approximately Emily's age, because I started the group when she was in kindergarten, um, basically to meet once a month uh, to go out to dinner. And at that time, we acted more like a support group. We would talk about all of the different um, struggles that we were going through. Uh, and, you know, we'd share the positive things about our kids and uh, suggestions on how to, you know, do things at IEP meetings. And we would also share resources with each other. Um, as time kind of fast forwarded, the group evolved, the group kept getting bigger, we were getting referrals from uh, early childhood for new families to come and join into our group. And um, we tried to limit it just to the Stillwater area where we live, because there's actually quite a few people around this area that have um, oddly rare genetic um, epilepsies. Um, a couple of the people in our group, we have some people that have children with SCN 8A, SCN 1A, SCN 2A, um, CA, CAC N 1A, <laughs> um, and a couple others. So all these, um, lots of sodium channel related epilepsies. Um, so we all kind of shared our medications that we used, although SCN 1A and SCN 2A are polar opposite of each other and cannot take the exact same medications um, as they can worsen seizures. Um, now, this group has evolved into more than just a support group. It is a true deep friendship. Um, a lot of us travel together. We have been on six different trips um, in the year of COVID. So in 2020, uh, in February, prior to COVID really hitting hard, we actually volunteered as a group down at Give Kids the World in um, Kissimmee, um, Florida. And we went to Disney for the weekend and ended up um, at Epcot in our big adventure that day was drinking around the world at Epcot. So we've become really close. When we do travel, we try and do things that we don't, that we're not able to do with our families. Um, so we've done, we've done zip lining, we've done some cliff diving in um, Mexico, we've uh, swam with the pigs in the Bahamas, we've swam with sharks, we do all sorts of crazy things that we normally couldn't do if we were traveling with our own families. After we got the gen genetic diagnosis, um, I did meet other families in Minnesota. Um, the families pictured on the couch are the first two families that we met. Um, the little girl with the bow in her hair is Amelia and she um, passed away not too long ago. Actually, they just celebrated her 16th birthday um, in heaven recently. And um, Charlotte is the next little girl with kind of the tie dyed shirt on. Um, those were the, the families that, I'm sorry, that's not Charlotte, that's her sister. Um, Charlotte is the baby that's being held. And then my daughter, Emily, um, is the one in the peach pants. And my other daughter, Isabel, is the one next to her. Um, these were moms that have been instrumental to me. Um, so when Emily got the genetic diagnosis, I actually um, started doing lots of research on the internet and, of course, typed in Facebook to see if there was anybody that knew anything about SCN2A. And there was already a group started by two moms that lived out on the East Coast um, and they, they started 
um, the SEN 2A Foundation for their children who both present as having more um, severe autism with epilepsy. Um, Emily is a little bit different. Emily is considered um, gain of function with her diagnosis, um, meaning she one had it at, had seizures at the onset of birth. Those typically tend to be the kids that are gain of function. And I believe it means that there's too much sodium going into her channel, um, which is why uh, she struggles with the, the level of epilepsy that she has. She still has uncontrolled seizures to date. Um, on average, she has about six um, absent seizures uh, every day. Um, which is significantly improved from the 1600 chronic seizures that she was having um, prior to puberty. So I call that a win. Um, and being um, at only six seizures a day is, in my book, very well controlled for her. So my, <laughs> one of my words of advice, I guess, is to step outside your comfort zone. Um, and one of the things that I've learned is that no matter if a kid has any challenges or not challenges, they will meet you where you expect them to be. So if you expect your, if you don't expect anything out of your kid, they're of course not going to do anything. So with Emily, we just always expected more of her. Now we were realistic with our expectations, but we didn't write her off as being someone that wouldn't be able to accomplish anything. Um, unfortunately for Emily, she is completely non-ambulatory. She was 100% dependent on um, adults for all daily living for everything. Um, she does not eat by mouth. She is tube fed. Um, she eats for pleasure. And, um, but she, her cognitive abilities, we have always expected that she understood what we were saying to her. Um, so at age 17 now, she um, has her caregivers read adult, uh, young adult um, books, and she laughs at very appropriate times. You can ask her questions about the book um, using eye gaze to provide answers for her. And she is very well aware of her surroundings. Um, she also knows when people believe in her and when people don't. So when I say have, you know, expectations of your kids, just, I mean, keep them within reality, but at the same time, your, your kids can perform if you can pull it out of them. And I always believed that Emily was in there. Um, one of two of my inspirations um, have been um, Helen Keller and, uh, oh my gosh, the name is totally escaping me, the gentleman who um, had um, Lou Gehrig's disease and it's, his name's escaping me right the second, but uh, they've always inspired me because just because you're not verbal and just because you can't point to things or grab things or move independently doesn't mean that you can't understand the world around you. Emily has been trapped in her little body. Um, for us, taking risks meant traveling. Emily adores traveling. Um, traveling has been a huge challenge, especially with a child that requires um, multiple nursing level cares like catheterization to help her um, empty her bladder. And so traveling has been a big challenge for us, but it's something that we take on multiple times in a year. And the picture on the right um, is the, a picture taken four years ago when we went to Banff on part of a multi-state and um, multi, I guess, country, because we went up to Canada um, trip that um, was probably one of my favorites so far to take as a family. And just letting go of the what ifs and the comparisons. Um, so early on in Emily's life, I was constantly um, questioning, well, what if I had done something different? Or what if I did this? Or what if I did that? Um, and that just wasn't healthy for me to constantly be um, uh, questioning all of the things that I had done to try and do um, and make life the best for Emily. Um, our ultimate goal for both of our kids is to provide the best quality of life that we can um, for them. Um, so it's my biggest recommendation for anybody at any age is to let go of the what ifs and the comparisons because life is definitely not the same for everybody. Um, here are some of the resources that I've kind of come across over time. Um, early on, there was some discussions about um, what if you're not diagnosed. There are actually um, some web websites that you can go to. I used to be um, on the board for the Families scn 2 Foundation, and I needed to step down to um, care for my father who has, um, he has dementia and he's fairly young. So it's it's been a huge on taking um, to now focus also on 
um, my parent in addition to caring for Emily with both neurological um, issues. But there are websites that you can go to um, to see if you qualify to get free genetic testing if your insurance is not covering for it. Um, genetic testing has come a long way and it continues to evolve. So fortunately now the um, SCN2A gene is a part of the epilepsy panel. Um, it was not when Emily was little. Emily had the epilepsy panel done at, as a newborn and she also had it done early or a little bit later on in her childhood um, prior to getting the whole exome sequencing. Um, for us, the biggest um, thing that I have come across that is helpful is uh, having Emily on waivered services. Every state has this set up differently, but it is a federal program that does trickle down to the states and the states then decide how they want to disperse the funding to the communities. Um, in Minnesota, um, we pay for something called TEFRA, which is a income taxed um, fee-based sliding, sliding scale fee for waivered services. So you have to have your child on medical assistance through the state. And then you pay a sliding scale fee every month um, until they turn 18. And at age 18, then they qualify for medical assistance and waivered services on their own income. Um, so for us, I put a link to um, the Department of Human Services, uh, more information about um, community-based programs. Um, but there is also a website that you could go to that is thekidswaiver.org, and you can find different waivered services in different states and how they run their programs. Um, another thing that I have found as a good resource is being a part of an organization um, like Hope Kids and Hope Kids is limited to the city or the states that it is servicing currently, but they are expanding quite a bit. Um, and Hope Kids is kind of like many wishes constantly being granted for families. We are invited to events like concerts or um, uh, professional sport game, you know, sporting events, um, different family gatherings. Uh, you can host a private event yourself. And it not only focuses on the child that has the, um, the, the struggles, the health struggles, but it also um, focuses on the, um, the siblings as well as the parents. So some events are only for siblings, some events are only for parents, um, and some are for the entire family or some are just for the Hope Kid. It's an awesome organization. Um, and we've recently also joined um, a kid again, which is a national organization, mainly focused in Ohio at this time. However, they do have events um, nationwide. Um, so those are kind of what I have found have been helpful resources um, for us. And this is Emily today. Emily is 17. And like I said, her sister is 14. And um, Emily loves to travel. That was the winter picture was taken uh, over Christmas break when we decided to just go up to northern Minnesota and celebrate Christmas outside of our home for the first time ever. Um, but that is all I have. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. And I hope I provided some sort of helpful information to people. And I'm sure a lot of it is stuff that people already do know, but I'm willing to answer any questions at the end. Thanks so much, Christy. And uh, what a beautiful family photo to end on, uh, showcasing the beauty of Northern Minnesota for everyone. <laughs> yes. And yes. we're glad that we don't have days like that because we know May can bring us that type of snow. Right. Uh, how about you uh, pull down your, your screen uh, and we can uh, close that out. We're gonna welcome back Dr. Doonan and Dr. Zeig. I uh, wanna be able to uh, ask and answer some questions and, and they'll be uh, available to all of you uh, to answer. And as uh, Christy closes out her screen share, uh, we'll be able to uh, bring others on. All right, how do I close this out? Let's see. Uh, great question. I wiggle usually your just... mouse at the top. You should be able to see a button that says stop share oh, or at yep. the bottom. Okay, I see that. There it is. All right. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. And if you can come back on camera, that's great. So a couple questions that came up in the chat, Dr. Dunin, it was during your presentation, but would love to hear uh, all of you weigh in where you have insights. The question is, uh, can you weigh in on autism and seizures, specifically late teen onset of seizures? Uh, I believe this was getting into the context of uh, what should be considered when 
this diagnoses are starting to be interwoven at that stage of life? Um, well, we definitely know that um, individuals with autism are at higher risk uh, for developing seizures in epilepsy. So that's it's not a totally uncommon scenario that somebody has autism and then will start having seizures or epilepsy. So I would say that um, the world of autism, how autism is evaluated is, is certainly ever changing. And uh, for a lot of individuals with autism, they don't have a clear underlying um, cause that's been look, even looked into. And so uh, when you add epilepsy, there is going to be a much increased um, probability that you might find a specific diagnosis, a genetic diagnosis. Um, for some individuals with autism, they may, may have never had a brain MRI. Um, and so certainly onset of seizures would trigger that really just looking into the etiology of autism and then epilepsy. And then, um, who, you know, the world is, I don't know, open to determine, you know, how that might be helpful for um, treating the individual and um, connecting the family and uh, patient with, with resources. So that's kind of the main thing I think of. I mean, definitely individuals that have epilepsy are at also higher risk of, of autism and, and you, you treat both conditions, you know, with a standard of care. And Dr. Zeke, uh, as you were presenting, I, I, I found this, uh, you all were complimentary in your presentations, Dr. Doonan and you. Can you talk about, uh, Dr. Zeke, uh, when folks are having uh, the onset of seizures, we know that we have these comorbidities. Can you talk about the neuropsychologist's role maybe early on in those days and what folks uh, maybe just wanting to know that they should be thinking about as they are probably further along in their journey. They're also trying to make sure that if I miss something, what did I miss? Right. That's a great question. Um, neuropsychologists tend to be involved once seizures, either acutely as seizures start to try to understand what brain regions are being involved or try to understand etiologies. Um, obviously, uh, neuropsychological testing is only relevant to individuals who are able to do it, so not infants, etc. cetera. Um, but oftentimes, we're not able to perform testing until someone's more stable, right? So if someone's hospitalized and in a coma, we can't really be helpful at that point. So it's all about the staging and the timing, as well as a person's level of severity. And generally, once someone is stable, we can either see them in the hospital or it's really an insurance issue or a staffing issue um, versus outside the hospital. And generally it's best to see someone, at least if they're in a stable condition, but epilepsy is trickier because it's a moving target. It's not something like a stroke where it's one and it's done and then it's stable going forward. People with epilepsy's conditions are constantly changing and evolving which makes it very hard to track cognitively, especially from a neuropsychological standpoint, because I could test someone you know, right after they get the diagnosis and maybe start on one med, but then their seizures might get worse or their condition might change, and then they're entirely different. So it takes a good communication and a good team-based approach and communication, the more complex or the more unstable a person's condition might be. Um, and generally, I would say, Try not to worry about your missing missing things. That I think that goes to Christy's kind of don't ask the what ifs, don't second guess. Um, if you're there getting getting your child or your loved one medical care, you're doing a great job. And generally, doctors will tell you when the right time is to suggest a certain service or a certain evaluation. Um, I generally tend to to try and support whatever individuals decide as reasonable and relevant. And I also just try to be honest about what's likely to be helpful and what likely might not give information. Sometimes it's people want to do additional testing or test again and again, well, can't we do this test again in two months or like every week? And it's just not going to be helpful. It's not going to provide any newer information. The results aren't going to change and it'll actually decrease the sensitivity because then there'll be practice effects, et cetera. Um, so I always try and reassure people and be as straightforward as I can about what would be helpful and when so that people aren't wasting their own time or resources, but also have realistic expectations, but also aren't beating themselves up of why am I not doing this every, you know, getting a neuropsych, seeing the neuropsychologist every week or every two weeks or getting this testing done when it wouldn't be helpful or needed and time and energy can be spent in much, much better ways. But epilepsy is hard because it's so, it yeah. can be so variable. 
Well, and, and that, um, that, that leads to actually my question, Christy, for you, because I feel like you all are interweaving your messages around good communication. Uh, and Christy, I'd love to hear as you all uh, have navigated your family's journey, it feels like you leaned on social support and community and built one uh, as a way to start to process and maybe not always be in communication with your comprehensive epilepsy team, but to be learning and caring for one another uh, within the context of what you were experiencing on a daily basis. Christy, what, what would you say for folks as, you know, they're thinking around this context of this is an onset and, you know, hearing the advice of, you know, you're going to be beset by the what ifs, but also find community so you can talk about the, the, the stages that you're going through. Christy, your thoughts. Well, my, my thought on that is um, we all experience, ex I, I would say, extreme grief with a diagnosis. Um, for some of us, it happens early on um, at birth. For others, they're unknown. You know, we didn't know until nine and a half, but we knew that the severity of the seizures were there. Um, so getting that, that support to go through those stages of grief and also knowing that everybody is grieving at different stages in mm. their journey. Mm. And so it's so important to understand that, that, you know, sometimes we, even as friends, we're just like, well, why are they just so hung up on that? And it's, you know, we all deal with things in a, in such a different manner. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a very realist person. I, I do believe in hope and I still always have hope, but that's where um, I needed that support from just creating a support group. I actually belong to a county group where we organized events for families that had um, kids with all sorts of different needs. And um, that was dissolved by the state. And when that was dissolved, that was my one night out a month that I always had set aside for myself because caring for yourself is so important. Mm -hmm. And it's so overlooked because we get so caught up in the craziness of life. And that was my only way to keep my sanity, which is why I came up with the name supporting our sanity, because I needed to keep that sanity by getting out of the house and whether we even sat sometimes and didn't even talk about our kids, um, you know, but just supporting each other through that, that journey of, um, of grief, which uh, resurfaces on a very frequent basis as you go through different stages of, um, well, for example, Emily is 17 now and she has a lot of um, gen ed friends and general education friends who don't have any struggles um, to the level that she does and seeing them all getting their driver's license is super exciting, but at the same time, heartbreaking, knowing mm -hmm. that she will never drive, you know, and so it, it, it's a constant up and down. So that support, finding that support system for me, I reached out to, um, well, social media wasn't, it wasn't the, as strong as it is now. Yeah. Now there's a lot more, you know, things that you can um, log into, but um, I just had to create that group and it took a long time, a grassroots group when there's HIPAA in the school mm -hmm. can't, the school can't provide you with parents or you go to a doctor's office and, you know, your, your doctor knows of another family. There's got to be this roundabout way where they can't like openly share their, um, their name with you and say, Hey, I want you to connect with this family. Um, you have to kind of provide your name and say, Hey, if you know any families, give them my name and we can mm -hmm. connect. So, yeah. Well, and, and that's, that's so, um, uh, I, I just love the, the message of the grassroots connection, and uh, we need to be providing this, frankly, on the ground in our local community services like the Epilepsy Foundation, because we need to be that critical bridge on scale. Uh, you, you are an example that it works, but we also need to be thinking about the ways that people are going to navigate. I have a couple other questions that popped up here, and I, I want to get to them uh, appropriately. I also, a question that came early on in the presentations was, uh, uh, in using antipsychotic medications along with multiple anti-seizure medications, uh, uh, the, the question is highlighting that there are effects to behaviors and daily living. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dunin and Dr. Zeig, I, I think that this is aimed at you of how the, the cocktail of medications in comorbidities we know is uh, ever present. Uh, how are you counseling folks to uh, consider, you know, uh, managing one one diagnosis uh, and not setting up a versus? But but how would you? How do you advise that thinking? 
Well, um, I think, you know, the use of, of the variety of medications, it just really has to be targeted to what uh, the person is experiencing at that time in their journey, right? Because it, it can certainly mm -hmm. change over time. And like I, I said early on in my talk, you know, sometimes it is the comorbid conditions that are really more pro problematic than the seizures. We know that um, fewer seizure medications at the lowest effective dose is going to be uh, provide the most op optimal, you know, cognitive situation for a person. Um, there is some data on um, which seizure medications might potentially um, co-treat. Some, so some seizure medications might provide some uh, benefit for some uh, psychiatric conditions. So those are things that could be discussed with a neurologist. Um, I think if there is a psychiatrist or other uh, doctor or provider that is prescribing the behavioral or psychiatric medications, it's just important, um, and unfortunately, this often does fall on the patient to really advocate and say, I'm on these medications, but I'm my neurologist, I'm on these, like, can you talk to each other? Are there interactions? Um, it's, uh, you know, as a neurologist, I don't always know what other people might be starting. And so sometimes I do get phone calls like, you know, I'm being started on this antidepressant medication and, you know, is there an interaction, but just always asking about interactions because uh, there certainly is a great potential for interactions between seizure medications and psychotropic medications. Um, let's see, I had another thought that flew into my brain. Oh, just in general, um, there are a lot of options for psychiatric medications and ADHD medications that don't provoke seizures. I took that out of my slide because my presentation was long, but just to kind of advocate for safety in using typical ADHD medications and antidepressant medications in epilepsy. So hopefully that kind of answers the question. Hey, listen, I think it's touching on a really important point. And Dr. Zeig, I, I heard in your presentation also the distinction between a neuropsychologist and a neuro. A, psych a psychiatrist, um, I have to assume that this is getting at that thread. Yes, it very much is. And, and it's so hard for patients to kind of navigate and know that difference. There's one syllable difference in our in, in our title um, in, in terms and what we're able to do. I also saw a question in the thread about do neuropsychologists see patients or just read map read the mapping in the neuropsych test? And that's an excellent question. Um, the short answer is most neuropsychologists focus on the assessment, um, doing the cognitive testing, interpreting those results and connecting with resources and generally just repeating that testing. There are a few rarer ones, I'm one of those, who really enjoy following patients over time. I think this is probably based on my background coming from more of a rehab setting where the assessment and treatment blur a bit more. Um, and I really enjoy working with patients and families. And I do think there's, having been in the mental health field as well, other mental health care providers might not know what neurologic conditions are or how they impact a person or their total level of functioning or how cognition might change a person's behavior. So I think um, there's a real niche for neuropsychologists who do enjoy more patient follow-ups. Generally, it's well received if you would like to provide that, but I recommend for patients to look for either neuropsychologists who offer follow-ups, or if they don't, generally they collaborate with close agencies that do. So they personally might not, but generally a practice they work with, a provider, one of their colleagues does, or they work with a rehabilitation institute that has psychologists that are really familiar and versed with a variety of conditions, generally neurologic conditions are included in that. And so they can provide really great follow-up services. I, I always sort of, I'm a neuropsychologist, but I do provide an atypical service and oftentimes providing psychotherapy and follow-up. Um, but it is a bit of a, I'm a bit of a false advertisement because I don't think many, th there aren't many. Um, so I, I do recommend though asking your neuropsychologist for their recommendations for that. Well, and to that point, I, I saw uh, also in some of the reference lists list from, from our presenters today that the encouragement to uh, be thinking about your, uh, as a caregiver, your personal mental health, your well-being is critical to the health of your loved one who's living with epilepsy and the comorbidities. Uh, and so I, I, I hear that power of the follow-up in, in your work, Dr. Dr. Zeig, and, and, and I want to say that we're, we're coming up on our time, but frankly, I have too many questions to get to, so I'm going to ask 
people, if, if we can go just five minutes longer till 1220, uh, because I think that this is a really important topic, I'm, I'm going to jump into another question. Um, it sounds like there has been a lot of research into genetic mutations of the sodium channel. What kind of research is available for the other channels? Uh, and what was listed was uh, the, the acronym GABA, et cetera, is the question in the chat. Docs? I, that's got to be in uh, in your direction, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try that. Um, well, I, I do believe that as part of this conference, there is a, a, a lecture or seminar on genetics in epilepsy. Yes. So I think that um, that's where um, this can be covered in more detail. Um, uh, you know, from my experience as a pediatric neurologist, I, I have many, many patients that have a variety of different um, genetic conditions rare genetic epilepsies, and um, often a one-off, sometimes two. Um, and um, what's really exciting to see is like Christy discussed um, the SCN2A foundation, many, many epilepsy syndromes have um, a foundation, or if not a foundation yet, um, a Facebook group. That seems to be, and Christy can correct me if there are other avenues, but that seems to be the main area where you can connect with other um, individuals with specific genetic epilepsies. Um, but I, I just love this area and, and how much um, improvements uh, and things that we're learning, but really foundations or kind of a family support group. Um, and then more and more um, of the foundations are um, putting on conferences specific to genetic, uh, with the genetic diagnosis, um, which I, I just love when my patients go to these and I always say, please come back and ask questions. Let me know what you learn. Um, let me know if there's somebody that, that I can talk to because I just simply cannot be an expert in each one of these rare conditions, but I, I always love to learn more. Dr. Zeke? One other thing that I, I really have enjoyed or appreciated within my short career already is seeing the advancement of science even from when I started my training to now. Um, and so for the rare epilepsies, genetics is definitely uh, one of the most common underlying causes, but then there's also like autoimmune encephalitis that are rare epilepsies that can wreak havoc on, on people and families at, at any stage of their life, which is just mind-bogglingly scary. Um, everything's going fine and then wham, oh, this, this new thing kind of comes up. Um, but what I've, I've really been encouraged by is seeing the overlap and interplay between how both of those fields have grown and in ways somewhat complementary. When we discover new autoimmune antibodies that might lead to cues about possible um, genetic markers to look for that might present in similar ways and the synergy between those two conditions and the way both of since I've started, how much more knowledge we have about each of those areas and the way they've informed each other, which is just encouraging, right? If it can change since I was educated to now, when I talk about autoimmune you know, um, epilepsies, it's such a huge list that I can't even keep track of them all. Um, it's just, it's, that's encouraging to me. Um, and I think that gets to where Christy also mentioned having hope. And so I'm hopeful that we'll continue to learn more and know more um, in a way that'll help benefit patients and families. You know, I think that that's the, the perfect final uh, point that I'm going to ask from each one of you, particularly in this space around the management that we're talking about. We're talking about the social and uh, cultural conditions that folks uh, uh, bust out of the isolation and find community uh, and narrowing it down to Christy's work. Uh, Christy, you're a champion in ways that, uh, frankly, the burden is all on you, but we need to continue to build uh, other communities where counties and then states uh, and then regions are working together. Uh, Dr. Zieg, your work in ensuring that people are thinking about the follow-up and the other considerations. Dr. Uh, Doonan on the front end of trying to give folks every step along the way the encouragement in the power of the clinic room. And, I, and I'm just going to uh, tag it as the arc of hope uh, that you all are touching on, that, that it's critical. And and actually, Christy, I remember uh, in your email signature uh, uh, that your email um, quotation is, optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope. Uh, and so in the context of this management, I, I, I would uh, love to end, Christy, on some final thoughts about this management from the on the ground, living it every day uh, with your daughter. What What is your final note around the management? What what do you want to leave people with uh, as they are, um, as they're stepping forward, uh, surely even today, uh, with 
challenges that are showing up with seizures and the other uh, comorbidity challenges. Christy, any, any thoughts as we wrap up this session? Um, one of the things that is probably the, the, the biggest underlying um, decision maker for our family is quality of life. Um, so our biggest focus has always been on Emily's quality of life. And sometimes that means not proceeding forward with the medication because the side effects weren't, weren't livable, um, even though it might have made things better in some way. So it's trying to find that balance. Um, and in, in addition to the quality of life for your child, quality of life for yourself. So mm -hmm. taking the time, um, caring for yourself. And it feels guilty at first. And I have a lot of friends who still feel guilt, <laughs> but it's so important um, because our, our bodies tend to deteriorate if we don't care for ourselves. Um, and as caregivers, it's, it's really, it's not uncommon for us to struggle with things. I, I personally struggled with breast cancer. Um, and so, you know, taking the time that was kind of an eye opener to me that forced me to take care of myself. I had no other option. <laughs> and so don't let surgery or any big diagnosis force you into caring for yourself, do it proactively and, and find the means to do so. And sometimes that means bringing your kid along with you that has the needs, but it's getting out and stepping outside of your comfort zone to build that quality of life as a family. Well, Christy, Dr. Zeig, Dr. Dunin, thank you so much for your time this morning uh, in, our, in, in this presentation. Uh, we look forward uh, to the continued thinking and engagement that we will have from this topic. This afternoon, we will have a question and answer with the Rare Epilepsy Network. We'll hear from a member from the organization of the Rare Epilepsy Network and lessons learned from the co-founding of the CDKL5 research organization uh, in an effort to create a solution. Today's moderator is Aisha Akhtar, who is the current Director of Education uh, with the Epilepsy Foundation of Greater Chicago. Uh, Aisha has more than 18 years of experience in public health and continues to be a leader in uh, efforts to educate our communities around the support for epilepsies uh, uh, and folks living with epilepsy. Our presenter today is Karen Utley, President and co-founder of the International Foundation for CDKL5 Research, also the coordinating committee member on the Rare Epilepsy Network and the Director of Patient Advocacy at the Texas Rare Alliance. Karen, Aisha, good afternoon to you. We're so glad to have you with us today. We look forward to your discussion. Thank you. So I'm really excited to to moderate this panel and give Glenn a much needed break from speaking all morning. <laughs> so thank you, Glenn. You've been doing an awesome job. So definitely a round of applause for you. Um, so I wanted to just kind of set the stage for this panel. Um, this is our second year doing this conference and some of the feedback that we got last year was that the audience, again, we are you know, dealing with Zoom, so things are a little bit different, but in as much uh, as we are able to, the audience wanted us to have a session that was as interactive as possible and very kind of informal and casual, and also wanted to kind of focus on some of the caregiving aspects. As we know, we've learned a lot about what happens in the rare disease space, and so we know that there's this entire arena of caregiving that is super important and we want to make sure that we discuss that and so we are super super fortunate today to have an amazing expert from the rare epilepsy network the ren um, and so karen is here so um, again I, I had asked people to kind of bring questions in um, but she's going to kind of walk through her story and talk about how she created an organization just like glenn said to solve a problem to create the solution and kind of like what lessons um, can we all learn from this and also as caregivers what lessons can we learn so um karen before so when you give your intro i also would like you to highlight a little bit about the ren itself i know that um, now there are maybe 32 organizations representing over 40 disease states. So if you could also just kind of give everyone a shared definition of where we are at today with the REN, that would be a great place to start. Sure. Thank you for the welcome. And I'm, I'm excited to be here. And again, I want to reiterate, I'm an open book. So if there's anything you want to ask, I'm happy to share. Um, I will say you're going to hear Samantha in the background. She's having a 
little bit of a rough day. And um, so, you know, just just hang in there with us and I will I will do the best I can with no nurse today. So, um, but so I will, I guess I'll share my screen. I just have a few slides and I'm going to do that as minimally as possible because I think it's better to just interact and have a space where we can ask questions, but it's just to simply give you a little, let's see. Oh, uh, let me share my screen. Uh oh, now I can't see me. So let's see. Nope. I don't know what happened. Let me see here. Let me see if I can share from OneDrive instead. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. You want to just. Am, mm -hmm. You know what? I am going to. I can share your slides. Okay. Thank yes. you. <laughs> yeah, I will get that loaded and you can start talking about the REN. Okay. So the Rare Epilepsy Network is really um, a group of a group of individual organizations that recognize that sometimes there's a lot of strength in combining our efforts. So the Rare Epilepsy Network started, I believe, with um, maybe about 10 groups, but now we are uh, in upwards of 70. Um, this is a slide that shows you, I don't think, I don't think it's completely current, but it does give you an idea that there's, there's a lot of us working together. And one mm -hmm. of the things I love about REN is they recognize the importance for you to work in your dis disease space specifically, and yet they're able to capitalize on the opportunities where together we're stronger. Um, I, our organization has been involved with REN from early on, but I became the representative from our organization in the Rare Epilepsy Network in about 2015 or 2016, I believe. And I can tell you that as a small organization, I learned so much from this group. Um, we have a great understanding and we recognize in some areas it's wise for you to be involved in and then sometimes your um, your group may need to not be involved in something and you're you're not going to get pressure one way or the other and that's one of the beauties of it for I can give a brief example our organization the International Foundation for CDKL5 research we have an NIH grant that's supporting the development of outcome measures so some of the work that's being done across DEEs for that we can't necessarily put our organization's name on because it's double dipping per se, right? We already have NIH funding for this and we can lend our voice, we can lend our experience and yet we can't necessarily sign on to some things because ethically we shouldn't. And that's been completely understood and supported in, from all aspects. So sometimes I think organizations are concerned that if they sign on and join something like the Rare Epilepsy Network, that if there's something they don't agree with or want to support, that it might um, cause problems. But I can tell you from experience, we let you join in where it makes sense and we respect if it doesn't. Um, so RIN's mission, thank you for sharing that, is to work with urgency to collaboratively collaboratively improve outcomes of rare epilepsy patients and families by fostering patient-focused research and advocacy. And then the vision is to support, grow, and maintain a network of rare epilepsy groups formed around a living overarching structure tasked with defining REN projects in which REN groups are able to choose to participate. So they're even in the vision. It says you, you have a choice. Um, there, there's been, there's a lot of um, advocacy efforts as far as for legal advocacy even and policy that we've learned about through, through RIN and been able to sign on to and be an active supporter of because of this network. Um, I think that about covers the introduction. I will briefly, Okay, REN members' priorities. I forgot that slide was in there. Thank you. Connecting yeah, we went a little out of order. 
Yeah, it, that's because I wasn't prepared to share my slides. I'm sorry, I joined on an iPad and then that was just complicated. Um, connecting communities, connecting providers to communities and connecting patients to research and clinicians. Um, another thing Wren does, sometimes a family is diagnosed and they find Wren. And if they reach out to Wren and there is an organization, they will put that family in contact with the organization. Um, if there's questions from a, a scientist, a researcher, a clinician that come to Wren, they will put them in contact with that patient group that is specific to that disease. And then, as I mentioned before, it really is an opportunity to network and join forces. Um, you know, the International Foundation for CDKL5 Research has established what we call uh, CDKL5 Centers of Excellence, but there have also been some, some groups through RAN that have joined forces and, and established some developmental epilepsy clinics uh, that, are, that are broader and not as disease specific. Um, to just give you a little bit of background on me, my daughter, Samantha, is 15. When she was 10 weeks old, she had her first seizures that set us on a journey to diagnosis. When she was 20 months old, we finally received a diagnosis for CDK, just a mutation on the CDKL5 gene, right? There wasn't even a name. Um, that's all the report said, she had a mutation on the gene. I was at Texas Children's in Houston, a world-renowned facility, and they knew nothing. And I found a small Yahoo support group, which is just, in, some of you may not even know what that is, but it's a Yahoo email support group. And I think when I joined, there were 10 families, and seven of us started the International Foundation for CDKL5 Research. None of us knew anything about nonprofits. We bought nonprofits for dummies and went from there. So I will tell you if you are someone wondering, can you start an organization for your disease space? You can. If you're someone wondering, do I have the skill set? You might not at the moment, but you can build it. Um, and Wren is a great place for that support system to learn from to ask, how did you do this? And to just seek advice. Um, when I started, that's what I was doing, seeking advice. And now I find myself at a point that I'm actually someone who can give some advice. So it's, right. it's, a, it's been a journey. And again, like I said, I'm an open book. So if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them. Sure. And I know there's a few uh, people who have kind of, who've called in, so they probably can't see the screen, but maybe we should read out some of the names. And I would love to know if anyone um, on this call, you see your organization represented. I think that that's an amazing, I mean, this slide is just amazing. Such a it testament is. to like the, the network, that the partnerships, the collaboration. And I think that's one thing that we have to remember in the nonprofit space is that we're not here to reinvent the wheel. We are here to create solutions and to, to lean on one another so that we can all share our stories and get closer to these end goals and sort of some of the immediate outcomes of like improving our quality of life every day and then getting closer and closer to, to freedom or a cure or just a better way of life. And I think what we've learned this morning is the importance of genetic testing and understanding the, different, the, the differentiation between the actual diagnosis and then having a syndrome. And I know, you know, you kind of just mentioned that even just briefly, but yeah, let's read off some of these names and see who's here. So we've got SCN2A, rasopathies.net. Let's see, I'm just looking at my screen, Dravet syndrome. And of course, LGS is one of those diagnoses that spans the genetic um, it, it spans across genes, right? There are right. many of us that our children end up with, with LGS. Um, I know Samantha also, she has an LGS diagnosis in addition to her CDKL5 diagnosis. Um, Fox G1, Cure Shanks, Batten disease, SCL6A1, uh, and, Ring 14. 
Yeah, Victoria just chimed in. She typed in the she's from IFCR. Yes, she is. Yep, she says Hi, hello. Hi, Victoria. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Test Foundation, and then of course even just cure epilepsy because there are families that they know they have a developmental epilepsy, right? But they don't have a genetic diagnosis yet. Right. Um. Kif one a that's another right. large group that's very active. Um, Angelman. Yes. Uh, so, so, I'm actually uh, going to be speaking next week in Nashville and uh, Natalie is my co panelist from Angelman so that'll be really exciting to meet her in person That is exciting. Yes. I don't know if I've said Casey and Q2 mm -hmm. yet uh, do do 15 Q. Um, so as as an advocate, as a leader within the REN, what are some of your day to day tasks, your goals? Like what how are you moving the needle forward? What are what is a day in the life of Karen? Oh, a day in the life of Karen as um, a caregiver, as a leader, as an advocate. So I'm always a caregiver first. Right. So so Samantha and her care and whatever structure that looks like on that day that comes first um many many days i'm on calls like this with samantha in the background um as far as my my work for rin i'm going to be honest i am new to this post i'm not new to rin but i'm new to the coordinating committee but i've always been involved with um and tried to lend voice to when people have questions. So one of the opportunities with Ren is a, I guess it's, um, oh, I know there's a name for it. It's a, I guess it's a Google group, right? We have a Google group that you can message. So um, a lot of people share resources. Um, you know, we have a family going through this. Do you have a suggestion or looking for clinicians a lot of a lot of people are trying to figure out how to develop experts in their in their space or in their field or find the doctor that does have awareness of the disorder so we do a lot of referrals as far um thing and you know trying to trying to just connect people to whatever their need is i would say that is one of the biggest charges of ren and then to for efforts that are looking to study across disorders, you know, providing, sometimes we do surveys through these groups and we encourage everyone to share them in their community. Um, currently, this brings up uh, something I wanna bring up and anyone watching, if you want to participate, the, the Epilepsy Foundation, they received, um, they received a grant to develop an ECHO I don't know if you know what an echo is or not, but it's an opportunity to develop educational materials that can be shared to help um, practitioners learn quickly about a disease state per se. Um, I think the initial one was done by a doctor who was having success in hepatitis C and patients couldn't get into him and he realized if I can share my knowledge um, treatment can can be done much faster and wider spread because anyone can do this if they have the resources. And so the, there's a process going on right now to build an echo for developmental epilepsies. So I think it's an opportunity to contribute where you feel like there have been gaps in your care or and also to um, share who do you think is most important to be educated? Um, who, who do you deal with the most that you need to know more about developmental epilepsies? So I think that was a good place to bring that up. Yeah, and I think, no, it's perfect because I think one thing that we are learning more and more, uh, you know, as epilepsy is in a more highly concentrated disease space, and again, something that Dr. French mentioned this morning is how important it is to be seen by an epileptologist when you're dealing with such an advanced case an advanced situation you don't want to be seen by a gp and so this project echo actually sort of connects that gap of like making sure that the gp the primary the pcp is communicating with these advanced uh, practitioners and so we are making sure that our people are getting seen by the highest quality of care so absolutely perfect time to say that that's right and when i was asked as one of the most important things to educate i said 
teach them that it's okay to call in neurology right away. The ER doctor doesn't need to be thinking he's got to handle this, right? Call right. in that neurology team right. and, and get this family escalated when you have when you have a baby that's having seizures. Right. Um, and not be afraid to ask for a second opinion, a third opinion. I think sometimes like we, I know like we try to educate our clients and make sure that we are teaching them how to ask the right questions and making them feel comfortable and, and to not feel afraid to, you know, ask the physician, okay, but I didn't really quite understand what you said. Could you say it again? You know, the, like, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and also the importance of recognizing and listening to the parent or caregiver. No one knows that child better than the parent or caregiver and listening to them. Um, I can tell you, I'm fortunate where we're followed and even if we have to go into an ER, um, normally I feel very heard and listened to, but that's not the stories I get across the board coming back to me from, from other family members. and. I think that I remember when we were first diagnosed feeling so helpless and almost thinking, I think when parents are, are newly diagnosed, they don't feel empowered to ask questions, right? Because they, have, they don't have the knowledge. And to me, that's one of the messages that I always give if I do a helping call or a family support call, my first thing is you need to remember you will always be your child's best advocate. 100%. You, you will be their best advocate and you are their voice. You right now, just make up your mind. If you don't, if you don't understand something, ask for clarification. If you don't agree with something, that's okay. Right. And if a doctor will not respect you and discuss those things with you, then consider finding a different doctor. Agreed. Yeah, that's really, really important as a caregiver to just to know that you have that right and, and that you might have to flex that muscle at some point and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. One, one other thing that I think is worth mentioning when we're talking about caregiver is the difference in what I, I see the diagnosis story changing. Um, Samantha, like I mentioned, was 20 months old before we received a diagnosis. And at that point, I absolutely knew something was wrong, right? I, I wasn't questioning, is there a problem? I knew there was a problem. And at that point, I just wanted to save my daughter's life. Like mm -hmm. I just didn't want her to die. Mm -hmm. And I see now these families, they're diagnosed pretty quickly after the first round of seizures, right? They go into the ER, they have a normal CAT scan, a normal MRI, uh, probably a normal lumbar puncture. So then now this epilepsy panel is drawn, right? It's drawn sometimes on that first visit to an ER or they're at admission. It's drawn and within a few weeks, they have an answer. Um, whereas I requested, a we were doing one test at a time to rule things out. I requested a test in February for a CDKL5 mutation it took till July to get an answer, right? It was five months later. Now they're getting these answers within a couple of weeks and they really haven't had any time to process that something's wrong. And then they're handed this devastating diagnosis. And as I love my daughter, absolutely value her, love her. The diagnosis is devastating, yeah. no matter how you slice it. Yeah. And I think that it is something not that one diagnosis story is better or worse, but they're, they're just different. I really think they're different. And then I think the, the impact of it is, is different. Right. So if we kind of stay on this, on this topic a little bit, as you're kind of reflecting back to Samantha's diagnosis, and then you, you know, how, how you got to here today, what are some of your top tips that you could share with other caregivers or th lessons learned or something that, you know, had you known it would have saved you time or energy, what, what can you share with us? So one, I would say, be kind to yourself, mm. be kind to yourself. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, the hardest lesson for me to learn is how slow science moves. 
and that's that's a hard lesson it's it's horrible so um when we were looking for a diagnosis they they initially thought samantha might have rett syndrome and then those tests were negative but it was at the same time that Adrian Bird had just come out with the results of the reversible mouse, right? And I remember watching the video and I thought, oh, they will have this cured in no time. I, I thought we would have a cure in five years. And Samantha's 15. And we've come a long way. Don't, 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 don't get me wrong. Things have come a long way, but science is slow, unfortunately. Yeah. And that's that's a hard lesson to swallow. Um, I, I do think that COVID has taught us some things as horrible mm -hmm. as it is, but it's taught us to think outside the box and to, to push limits. And to me, that's, that's good. And I think we'll end up with more telemedicine, which mm -hmm. will give uh, people in rural area, areas better access to care mm -hmm. and access to um, people who've actually seen another child with the same disorder as your child, mm -hmm. which a lot of times people don't, don't get to have that experience, right? right? They don't get to see or talk to someone who actually knows. Right. As and they far can as see people from all over the country now, because there's not that limitation of geography. I mean, I think that that's definitely been a positive game changer from the pandemic. For sure. Um, as far as lessons from um, the perspective of organizations, the other thing I've learned is it, it's hard for people, I think people in our situation with, with children that have these debilitating disorders, sometimes we're just drowning, right? And so I really, believed that when we started the organization that we would just have people lined up to volunteer. I was wow. like, everybody will help. Everybody will do it. But what it was is for me, for me, I, I've said many times, I knew I had to do something because it gave me a sense of control in an out of control situation. I couldn't fix Samantha, but I could do something. So I did something. Uh, along with six other parents, we started an organization. We started then raising funds. We then, we knew we had to establish biological models, so we did it. We wanted to create experts, so we started our centers of excellence. We needed outcome measures if there's a successful gene therapy, so we did that, right? We're, we've, we've seen these things and we've done them. We've seen it and we've done it. And but for me, that was helpful because it gave me what I needed to feel like I was doing something. Sure. Whereas for someone else, if they feel like they can't catch a breath, they just can't. Yeah. And I think that's also the beauty when you're working with one another is like, like you said, it's a marathon on a sprint and everyone's working at a different speed and something that you might bring to the table could help someone else and vice versa. So again, that entire network of collaborating is so critical here. And I, the one other thing I'll mention, I remember early on one of our, one of my co-founders, she was, her children were older. And I remember her saying, you have to take care of you. And she was encouraging us to get care for our child and take a break. And I remember thinking, I cannot leave my child. Oh. Like, no way. Yeah. And now I realize you have to take care of you. I didn't realize that until I had been sleep deprived for three years and actually Oof. became very ill myself and was told, okay, you're going to get rest and turn this around or you're going to cause permanent damage. Wow. And it was very eye opening. And so now I find myself trying to give that same message, right? Be, take care of yourself. But again, until the individual hits the place where they realize it, you feel like you can't, oh, right? Sure. You feel like no one else can take care of them. They're not safe. And I had a great, and I had a great support system. I had parents, I had, you know, Samantha's father, right. but I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't leave. And Samantha sees every time she slept. So I oh. slept with her on my chest and every time she fell asleep, she had a seizure. So we were awake and that went on for three years and oh. I don't know how I survived, but, um, I did have to learn self-care. 
yeah. out of absolute necessity. Survival. Yeah. 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 You're right. You're right. Wow. So I wanted to ask you, you mentioned uh, gene therapy, and I, I wonder if uh, people on the call might be interested in learning a little bit about that. Um, I know it's it, that uh, that field is growing. Uh, I've been working for the Epilepsy Foundation for 11 years, and in just my 11 years, like I know there are hundreds and hundreds of genes now that are responsible um, for various types of seizures, epilepsy, and syndromes. And could you maybe talk a little bit about what that process is like and how that works? And hopefully we can get more people to kind of get in, involved with genetic therapy. So, you know, first you have to have a company interested in your space, right? Um, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, there's been some discouraging things this year, right? You've seen programs dropped, right? You've seen things shelved. Um, we had a, we had a, a company working in our space on protein replacement, and that's kind of been moved aside from what I understand. It was publicly announced by Amicus. Um, it's, it's a challenge. And All I can say is for, for me with IFCR, it's very important to us that we never, we don't put our, all of our eggs in one basket, right? We're trying okay. to work, yeah, that's we're, good. we're happy. There are a couple of companies that have gene therapies in the pipeline. We are encouraged by that. They are still preclinical. I think it's very important to be honest with families and to manage expectations in a way that's realistic you know, when something is still preclinical and it's still, the work's still being done in animal models, we have to be honest about that. Um, and everything that works in an animal doesn't always translate to human. I think, I think that the, the communities deserve that transparency. And um, I feel like as an organization, we've, we've tried to make that happen. And the, the companies we've worked with, I know um, you can visit our website. I think they're I don't remember if it was a recorded webinar or not, but Ultragenics has been really great to share with our community in ways that is, I believe is honest and transparent. Here's where we are and we're encouraged right. and we're hopeful, but here is still where we are, yeah. right? And um, I think one of the biggest things you can do in a disease space to be appealing to, um, to companies is to build a strong community, which mm. I feel like our organization has done that. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a small community and then there's uh, infighting and oh. groups kind of um, tearing at each other, what happens is you put everyone else in the middle. And, and I understand I'm not, I understand different different people have different thoughts on how things should be done and everyone has strengths, but I would, I would say be cautious with um, how you interact in that space because there are, there are organizations or companies that will leave your space because they don't want to be in the middle oh. of that. Also scientists and clinicians as well, right? Clinicians yeah. don't like to be put in the middle either. Right. And, right. um, mm -hmm. There's, there's lots of, there's lots of rare developmental epilepsy, so they can mm -hmm. always go work somewhere else. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> In a different no, I think space. That's, that's really great advice. Like, it sounds like what you're saying is, yes, we have this tool that can be available to us, you know, taking this genetic panel that can lead to gene therapy that can improve, but then not to put all our eggs in one basket and also put as much information as you can because whatever you put into it is what you're going to get out of it so making sure that you do your homework as well not just kind of expecting like right. you said science to fix everything well and i think you know you have to not everyone will necessarily be a candidate for gene right. therapy either sure. so we need we need to keep looking for compounds to treat the symptoms as well as um as well as looking for uh, you know, uh, more encompassing disease modifying treatments, right? Right. And, so, and mm -hmm. go ahead. No, go ahead, please. We also sometimes, you know, you have to do the work to figure out is there is there a window 
for gene therapy? Is there is there a window? Is there a time frame? And I think there's a possibility that that's different with each disease space. Maybe one disease space has a broader window and you can right. turn a lot of things around later, whereas maybe another disease space you have a, a one year window or three right. year window or and and I think it's worth making sure you invest in those those bench science projects that right. will give you those types of answers. Right. And that's literally what the question just uh, popped up from Michelle uh, that I was going to ask as well. Like, what are some of those best questions that you might want to ask? And like sort of starting from the end goal, what what is it that we want to ask the physician? Like, so the timeline, like what can I expect? How long does all of this take? What are the outcomes? I think those are really good questions to kind of walk into that meeting with. Also knowing that not every epileptologist is going to have that specialty in genetics. This is definitely not a very common field. No. So um, I'm going to assume this question is in regard to undiagnosed, right? So you're, you're visiting a geneticist with the, with the hopes of finding a diagnosis. Is that how you're reading yes, that? Yes, that's exactly well? how I'm reading it, yes. So I would, I would hope that the first thing they do is run the, the genetic epilepsy panel. I, I would hope Agreed. that that's the first test they run. Right. Um, if not, definitely request that. Yeah, <laughs> because it, right. and it's it free. Tests for, it tests for many of- many of the known genetic epilepsies. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's the starting, that, that's the baseline, that's the blueprint. From there, we can get information to ask more important questions or more poignant questions and then come up with results that are, you know, smart so we can have these outcomes that we can measure. I think another challenge is sometimes these panels go off and you, the, the results give you more than one mutation, right? And so then you're left with which one is actually disease causing or are they both or are they all disease causing? And and that's a challenge as well. And so that's where you need to proactively advocate for genetics counselor who mm -hmm. can help you sort through that information. And um, one of the challenges I also see with um, as new genes are discovered, you don't always know a lot about the gene, right? And which areas are disease causing, which areas maybe are not disease causing. Um, and, and that comes through really data collection and right. participating in efforts to study genotype and phenotype. So right. the other thing I would say is if you have a genetics diagnosis and there are efforts in your community for data collection, participate. I know it's time consuming. I know everyone gets tired of the surveys, but the only way that we can yeah. learn the answer to these questions is for the caregivers to give right. us the information. Right. And I mean, if we if we don't see ourselves in the data that's being presented, then it's our responsibility to be a part of that data. And the next panel uh, this afternoon is actually going to talk a little bit more about getting involved in clinical trials and some of the trials that are actually going on and how they're actually making some changes in headway. And so I think that might be a good time to kind of, uh, for one, revisit just the definition of rare epilepsy, how it you know impacts fewer than 200,000 people um, per you know disease state, but then also what are you seeing right now as some of the trends in the rare epilepsy space or are there breakthroughs that you're seeing? Like, are there any places where there are roadblocks and then other places where we've made some significant headway? Well, I think one of the areas where there's always roadblocks with our community and trials is, is getting there, right? I mean, so my daughter actually travels really well. She loves to fly, she loves to ride in a car, but that's not always the typical. Um, we're actually participants in a trial and it required um, that we traveled, so we, we flew. And it, it saddens me because I know there are people in our community that would benefit from these types of opportunities, but the travel is not realistic for them. Um, so I think that breaking down barriers with, um, hybrid trials um, or, you know, kind of 
stepping outside the box and looking at how can we break down access barriers in clinical trials. And, and I, I understand we have to be safe, we have to um, collect data in, in um, the same way across the board, right? We, we need it. We need it to be, you know, our, our data has to have good integrity. And um, I, I get all of that, but I do, again, I think this is one of the things we learned from COVID because guess what? We didn't have to stop our clinical trial. We got to do a lot remote. We were able to do blood draws locally and do our visits via telehealth. And all I can think is, why aren't we doing this now? I mean, why aren't we going to continue this? Why are we going to return to the other methodologies which, which limit who has access? Um, I, I think that the families like me who got a taste of that will press to make sure we, we look with a more open mind and, and break down those access barriers. I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but. Um... Well, I think that that's also something just in general that the pandemic has unveiled uh, where we knew all along that there were all these inequities and inequalities and disparities. And I think that when you add the lens of epilepsy, which is a, an expensive chronic disease, I think that's complicated. And then when you go a little bit further, you're adding this, this other layer being in the rare epilepsy space, which is even more complicated. And so I think people are, are trying to find ways to kind of come out of all of these different layers and be able to, to get the, the answers to the questions that they have, to have access, and then not even like, so access and cost and quality is, you know, sort of like the iron triangle of public health is what, what I always say. And that's something that I'm, I'm really, really cognizant of is that, let's say for example, we're in Illinois. So we are, I am in Illinois. And in the Chicago area, there are, let's say, seven or eight level three and four epilepsy centers that I could literally just on a whim decide whichever direction I want to go to. And there are all the all, I have all this access, but that's not the case. As soon as I drive like an hour or two hours south, um, southern Illinois is, becomes this desert. And then again, we're adding this extra layer. So then that's the that's the access issue. But then thankfully. The one, as you said, one of the good things about COVID is that we've learned how to adapt with telemedicine. And of course, there are certain limitations, like you can't have your blood drawn, et cetera. But at least we have uh, improved patient adherence. The patients are showing up for their appointments to some extent. And then, like you said, working with local pharmacies or you know PCP outposts to do that blood work. So I think there is that positive mo movement. And I think that that access is that barrier to access is probably going to slowly diminish. I think once people understand how they can get their needs met in these areas. So I think that's true. Like that can definitely be considered a breakthrough in the rare space. Yeah. I think another big positive in the developmental epilepsies about telehealth is that the, the clinician has an opportunity to view that child in their environment. They're going to see things they would never see in their office. So true. That's that's just a fact. You know, my daughter does a lot more in her home environment than she does in the doctor's office because it's not familiar. Um, so I think that is that is a, a benefit to that as well. For sure. I'm just going to take a peek and see if we have any questions for Karen in the chat. I know because this is the webinar format, it's a little bit different, so it, it's like quiet. <laughs> right. But but uh, yeah, it, you know, it works this way. Um, thank you for bringing up some excellent, important points. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, we wanted this to be this like. So Samantha's gonna she's gonna pay us a visit. Hello, Samantha. Come, on, well, no, come all the way. Come here, come here, come all the way. Come on, come say hello. Hi. Hi. Say hello. You can come say hello for just a minute. Hi, Samantha. Say hello. Hi. Say We're hello. learning all about you today. Oh, <laughs> you have an amazing, amazing mom. Hey, thanks. I made her that way. Say Aww. I made her that way. <laughs> I, I do laugh and say that 
my entire life, all I ever wanted to be was a mom. In uh, seventh grade, our choir director asked us each to stand up and say what we wanted to be when we grew up. And I stood up and I said, I want to be a mom. And she goes, no, I mean for your career. And I said, that's what I want to be. I also laugh and say in seventh grade, I had a very lucrative babysitting business as well. (laughs) So, I mean, I, I, I did. And I, you know, I did have a, I mean, I worked, I, we had a family business. I did accounting, payroll, book work, you know, for a corporation that, that was family owned, but my heart was with being a mom. And then along came Samantha and suddenly I've just, Amazing. Had to become something else. <laughs> Amazing. Do you have special plans tomorrow for Mother's Day? Um, I'm going to work a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> That's my plan with that my mother. Good. That's good. That's so, nice. Yeah, we'll, we'll spend time with my mom and just be together as a family. Yeah. That's and I think, so that's another thing that we can talk about is the sandwich generation, right? So you, you might be caring for your mom and then you're caring for your own daughter. And so, I think- yeah, no, my, I'm fortunate. My parents, my parents, my dad is 84. My mom was, well, is 78. Um, I'm sorry, my dad's 83. He won't be 84 for a few days, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm fortunate because they are in excellent, excellent health. So right. uh, there's, there's no caregiving for me for either of them, Excellent. but, excellent. but you are right. Um, I, I know families in our community that are facing that same challenge, right? They have a child that requires 24-7 care and they're moving into a space where maybe a parent needs that as well. Um, And and those are are major challenges to, to try to meet because we can only spread ourselves so thin. Right, right, for sure. So one thing that we've done in Chicago during the pandemic is we started a caregiver support group. And what we did is we realized we realized that that was like the one group of, of people that were that we were missing. Like we had we have our clients and then we have schools that we do community trainings for. And then we really wanted to make sure that we gave um, TLC to our caregivers. And so I, I hope that other, you know, I know that we are being represented here by a total of four Epilepsy Foundation affiliates, but for, for people who might not be coming calling in from one of these four places, how can someone get started in getting involved in that caregiving network? So I know I can speak from our organization. We run a family support program. So that was one of one of my driving factors was to make sure families didn't feel alone. Um, I think that the challenges you can, as, as an organization, you can offer the, the group support, right? But if, if someone lives in an area where they don't have access to the respite care they need, um, perhaps, for example, in Florida, it's very, very difficult to get on a waiver, on a Medicaid waiver. So I have families who've been on those wait lists for 15 and 16 years. And so that means they don't get the respite care. They don't get the help that they need. And in those situations, you can provide all the group support you want, but that doesn't help them with the root of the problem. Um, so I, I think it's, it's sad, but in this, in this country, in some states, we're really letting families down because they, they don't have the support they need, and they can't take those breaks that give them the mental health break that, that they desperately need. What sort of collaboration would you like to see happen with the RUN and maybe other organizations, the Uplifty Foundation overall? Where, where would you like to see the RUN going and your participation in the RUN? So I, I think there's, there's a lot of areas that need work. And I do know that Ren um, shares many of the efforts. Let's say if there is a state that is doing advocacy to improve access to Medicaid waivers or things such as that in their state, you'll learn about that and you'll have an opportunity to sign on. Our organization has signed on to, 
to many, many letters for not only access to care, but access to medications, you know, efforts. I'm sorry, Samantha's really loud. So I hope you all can still hear me okay. But efforts, you know, for step therapies and things such as that to those, those are areas where the bigger voice is much mightier, right? right, right. And if, if you are, if you are a person who has an interest in advocating for policy, I would say, one, find your disease support group if you have a diagnosis, but also if you have a rare disease um, effort that's active in your state. Um, one of the other hats I wear is director of patient advocacy for the Texas Rare Alliance. Right. And that is a group that does not just developmental epilepsy, but it's, it's rare disease. Right. Um, and it's, and we advocate for efforts to for access to care, but sure. also to access to services. Right. And I am going to walk to another room because she is safe, but I can walk okay. to an area where she's not quite so loud. Okay. And, thank and you. She's thank so good. You. Oh, <laughs> thanks for hanging on. Thank you. Just maybe like one or two more questions and no, we'll let you're you go. Fine. Okay. So, so yeah, you absolutely brought up a very, very important point. And, and Victoria is here saying that Illinois, uh, yes, we have a lot of hoops to jump through yet. And that's why patient advocacy is so critical. And those advocacy days down in Springfield and getting connected with your local representative, knowing who your elected reps are, visiting them. I know the Epilepsy Foundation has an amazing program where we bring in teens every year to DC and we teach them how to be advocates. We teach them how to share their story. It is so, so critical to share those stories with our elected officials who often don't really know what a day in the life is really like. You, you are correct. And um, there are, I would say that's another thing. You don't have to do that through a group. Right. You can email your representative and request a time. Right. And they will meet with you. And I, the first time I did this, I did it on the, on the federal level when we were having our patient focused drug development meeting. We did a day on the hill just a day earlier, right? So we went, we went in early and we did a day on the hill. And I will admit it was the first time I had participated in that on a, on a larger scale like that. And I could not believe the reaction I, I received from these representatives. Um, and I now have a really great relationship with my congressional representative because of that in-person meeting. To the point he's given me a more select email and he has said, when there is something I can help with, please reach out because I'm a awesome. dad, I'm a grandfather. And I had no idea some of these, even as a representative, he didn't understand the challenges. Like you said, they don't, they don't know what that day in the life looks like. Right. And I think that if more of us would connect on personal levels, then you would have more representative with a personal connection, right? For sure. It, it, it's just, it's very different than hearing it out here. Like, oh, we need to help these caregivers. But then with, when what you hear is, I've had to miss my other child's choir concerts or band concerts or award ceremony because my daughter is so loud, I can't attend with her, but I have no care to attend without her. So someone has to stay home, right? right. Um, so, like my, my daughter is very loud. So I can't go to a movie. I can't go to uh, a concert. I can't, um, you know, I have another friend who has a daughter with Rett syndrome and she's very quiet. They can go anywhere, yeah. you know, but my daughter is extremely loud. So we, we don't, we don't go anywhere. Uh, yeah. a restaurant, we try to eat outside. So if she's loud, you know, yeah, and outside. not, not because I'm ashamed of her, but because I have a little bit of respect for all the people around us as well. Right? Sure, and that's just, that. Those are her needs, and you are those finding are ways needs. to make her needs met. And and what that's you're right. doing is sharing that story to these elected officials who can hopefully change some policies or create better solutions so that 
more people like your daughter have a better yeah. way of life. And, you know, Samantha's record for no sleep is over 72 hours. Wow. And I will never forget, um, I, I am a single parent, and I will never forget she had made it 72 hours and she finally went to sleep and I thought, I'm going to sleep. And I slept through a seizure. And Samantha's seizures were so violent, she would end up with petechia all over her face. The next morning when I woke up and I looked over at her, I saw the petechia all over her face. So I knew I had slept through it. And I remember I immediately picked up the phone and I called her dad and I said, if she's ever gone 24 to 48 hours without sleep, she has to come sleep at your house because that can't happen again right? I, I can't sleep through a seizure. I, I have a I have video cameras because I keep them for nurses. I went back. She had a seven minute seizure. I slept through. Hmm. Those types of stories are what people need to hear and understand. That's why people like us have to have an alternative caregiver to give us a break. Yeah, right. I think it's such a positive way to end uh, this 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 call today and this your panel and I think your message is just so positive and empowering and I think the call to action I would say is find out who your elected official is and write them a letter tell them this you know your life story tell them what we've learned today and I think that that's a great way to start and it's how we are going to make a big difference as a community and they are all meeting over zoom now so right. so take easy that meeting take that time let them see someone saying i tried to take my daughter with me every time absolutely if you can do that do that because it does make a difference it's important right. for them to see right wow thank you karen there's a lot of really great comments coming in the chat for you um thank you so much for your time and we are we were so happy to be able to see samantha today so that was a treat <laughs> And so I hope you enjoy your Mother's Day tomorrow making a jigsaw puzzle. Thank you. And yeah. Same, same to you. And the other, the other call to action I would mention is if you do have a local group, if you do have a disease specific group, get involved with them, find something, commit to, you know, one hour a month to volunteer or something. Um, and then Beautiful. if you, if there's someone in your disease space that has made a difference to you, thank them. I love that. Oh, perfect. Well, I want to thank you for being here. And I know so many people have learned a lot from you today. So thanks for your positivity. Thank you. Have a great one. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Glenn, who's going to bring us home. Thanks, Aisha. Thank you, Karen. What a great conversation. I love the engagement and I uh, really appreciated the engagement we had from everyone. Uh, really, really appreciate everyone's uh, engagement there. Uh, we are so excited uh, for you all to be here at the Upper Midwest Rare Epilepsies Conference, uh, Saturday, May 7th, 2022. Uh, as we go into our final panel of day one uh, and discussion, just so appreciative of the excellent engagement we've had throughout this day, uh, as well as uh, just the really excellent presentations that have taken place. Uh, and uh, this afternoon's presentation and conversation, we are lucky and blessed to have uh, just two of the best in the epilepsy community with us this afternoon. Uh, today's moderator for this presentation is Dr. Brandy Fuhrman, the Chief Outcomes Office of the Foundation. Brandy, it's so good to see you and we're so grateful that you would join us. Uh, this is a very busy season for the team at the uh, the forefront of the good work happening out in our communities uh, and also for national engagement uh, that is moving forward. Uh, her, uh, her partner in this discussion uh, this afternoon uh, is, is Dr. And I want to make sure that I get the name exactly right because uh, uh, Dr. Peter Warnicke, uh, neurosurgeon and researcher at the University of Chicago Medicine. Uh, Brandy, Dr. Warnicke, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. We look forward to your discussion on the pipeline research, new therapies and medications 
what's on the horizon in the world of epilepsy surgery and medication in the rare epilepsy space, uh, what we know is new and what can we expect to come. Thank you and Brandy, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Glenn, and uh, thank you to you and all the other organizers of this conference for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here, um, and I think that you are uh, really paving the way for more of these regional rare epilepsy conferences, which are so important because allowing folks to meet the folks in their areas who are going through some of the same things that they are is so important. Um, I want to make sure that you are seeing my screen, which should have a title slide. Is that what's showing up for you? That's exactly what um, I think just off to the right hand side that we see a little slither of your scroll of the number of slides. Just uh, make sure okay, I was trying to share the presentation <clears throat> view, so it may be that I did not pick the right view. I'll be right back. Um, so the talk that uh, Dr. Warnicke and I are giving today, I hope will be a very um, exciting and hopeful one for you to enjoy because what we're talking about is not only the different ways that therapies are available today to try to help treat uh, rare epilepsies, but some of the really exciting work that is coming on the horizon to treat epilepsy uh, in all its forms, but especially in rare forms. Glenn, how am I doing on the... We are almost there. It's just almost waiting for the presentation now to start. You're now at the, um, at the home slide. It's still showing as if it was in um, the initial stage. So it's just, uh, I think it's time for view uh, or to start the PowerPoint. But I think this is the right slide or the right um, panel. Okay. Deck. So if you go to the bottom right, you might see that little computer presentation mode. If you hit that, it should, there you go. Looks better? Mm, didn't change. Not yet. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, we can work with that. Okay, well, I'll try one more time. And if it doesn't uh, go well, we'll just go with it. Yeah. I apologize for my technical limitations. There it is. Great. You nailed it. It's there. All Can't right. There. Try, try again. <laughs> That's my motto. Okay. Um, I wanted to start by sharing with you uh, my disclosures, and that's an important feature of all the talks that I hope you hear uh, in this session, but also in other conferences, because uh, I want to share with you that my compensation comes entirely from the Epilepsy Foundation, and that means that um, my comments are are not hopefully unduly influenced by any other source of revenue. Um, I have received some funding for research or public health projects from the groups that are listed there. And another disclaimer is that I'm not a physician. I'm a, a research scientist, but I'm not a physician. And so I'm speaking to you mostly from a scientific point of view today. Dr. Warnicke will be taking uh, both a scientific and a medical point of view today. In either case, I think we will not be able to answer individual questions about uh, medical situations. We will always encourage you to talk to your doctor or find a specialist um, to ask your individual questions. Um, I also wanted to mention that Dr. Caitlin Greskoviak is uh, the Senior Director of Research and Innovation for the Epilepsy Foundation of America. And she is enjoying, I think, the uh, last month of her maternity leave with a new baby boy. So we are looking forward to her return, but she is certainly one of our uh, in-house experts when it comes to research and new therapy. Okay, are the slides advancing for you? Nope. They're not. There we go, oh, those were disclosures. And yes. Caitlin, okay. And now, key takeaways. Um, what I hope that you come away from, from this introductory presentation with are the fact that there are many different treatment options available right now for uh, treating the epilepsies. And one important point, uh, and it's especially important for folks who are dealing with complex epilepsy, if you're still having seizures after a year of trying with a primary care physician, a pediatrician, a, 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 a general neurologist, and or after trying two or more and uh, anti-seizure medications, and you're still having seizures, you need to be seeking out the next level of specialty care, epilepsy specialty care. Now, I want to make a caveat here. 
when you're dealing with children, um, especially young children, personally, I would be much more urgent in terms of uh, seeking out uh, specialty care for children. Because when kids have seizures during their critical developmental years, there can be long-term impacts. And so getting kids to the right level of care as quickly as possible is really important. My guess is that many of you on this call have already gone through some of that uh, odyssey, but getting to the right level of care is critically important. Um, I also want you to take away the idea that there are many more investigational therapies, um, medications, devices, new surgical approaches, uh, in fact, new biologic approaches are coming through the pipeline. And that means we need to be very vigilant for what's coming out next. Um, simply because you haven't found something that's worked yet doesn't mean that there isn't something coming soon that might have uh, more hope. And so that's one of the things that I hope you will take away as a, as a hopeful outcome from this talk. Our treatments are really starting to evolve. We're really at an inflection point, I think, in terms of not just treating seizures as a symptom of epilepsy, but treating the underlying causes, the reasons that people have epilepsy. And that is another reason to be very, very hopeful. So knowing the cause of your epilepsy is getting more and more important. And if you haven't been able to find a cause for your epilepsy, that's a place to keep pushing, to keep asking questions, to keep looking for options for uh, diagnosis and evaluation with a specific etiology. And finally, I hope that uh, hearing a little bit about the talk that, that I'll share with you and also Dr. Warnicke's talk, you'll consider uh, participating in a clinical research study. The only way we get new treatments is if people agree to participate to test them. And so by doing that, you're helping uh, potentially yourself, but also really helping your community. So those are the things that I hope that you take away from today. Um, okay, so there, like I said, there are many different types of treatments available. Just a quick overview for those of you who might be newer to the field. There are medications, there are surgical approaches, there are neuromodulation devices, um, some of which are implanted. Some of the newer ones may be non-invasive. Um, there are medical diets. There are self-management programs, which may not be a, a cure, but certainly can help people better manage uh, the uh, seizures and the triggers of their seizure. Finally, there are new things on the horizon uh, that might be known as gene-targeted therapies. And again, getting back to this idea that when we understand the underlying cause of the epilepsy, we can design treatments that very specifically target those underlying causes. So lots of reasons to be hopeful. This slide just shows you the um, evolution of different types of uh, drug treatments for epilepsy over time. And um, this is a, a very common slide to use in an epilepsy treatment presentation. The point is um, our, our available medications to treat epilepsy have really exploded in the last couple decades. And one of the challenges is making sure that people get access to these types of medications and also that we're using those medicines in the right uh, epilepsy types and syndromes. So um, there has been, uh, I think, a faster pace of new medicines coming out than there has been research to evaluate in whom does this medicine work best. And so that's something that we, uh, especially in the epilepsy learning healthcare system, are interested in trying to understand in a real life, uh, real world situation, which drugs are working best for which types of, of epilepsy. Now, I wanted to give a very brief overview of um, some of the ways that we think about classifying epilepsy right now and some of the ways that it will be changing in the future. So uh, this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but if you start at the top, you see that there are different seizure types, focal onset seizures, generalized onset seizures, and seizures where we, we don't we're not able to tell where that onset really happens, whether it's focal or generalized. And really that refers to where does the seizure start? Does it start in a small area, one area, a focal uh, beginning to the seizure, or does it seem to uh, take place uh, across the brain at the same time, a generalized onset seizure? And this has been important because for the most part, this is the way that treatment decisions are made. There are certain drugs that work well for focal seizures. There are certain drugs that work well for generalized onset seizures. And it's important to know which type of seizure you're treating. 
um, all many of the drugs that I showed on the previous slide are, are going to be working well for either focal or generalized, or in some cases, those uh, drugs can work on either type. So the, uh, the way we choose medications right now really depends on seizure type. It depends a little bit on epilepsy type, whether it's a combined presentation, both focal and generalized, many of the rare conditions, people might have both types of those seizures, it makes it more complicated. And finally, whether there is an epilepsy syndrome at play, and many of our rare epilepsy syndromes fit into this, into this category. So uh, primarily, medications are chosen by seizure type. If we know the epilepsy type or the epilepsy syndrome, that can also help influence uh, the choice of medication. But the place where things are really going to be changing is in this column all the way to the right, where you have etiology. And that is a fancy word to say the underlying reason for the epilepsy. So there are multiple different types of etiologies. Um, we sometimes call uh, acquired epilepsy uh, some of the etiologies where there's been trauma to the brain, and that's what results in later seizures. Um, an, a stroke or other injury to the brain uh, can be a reason for then developing later seizures. On the other hand, there can be genetic or metabolic causes of epilepsy, and that can result in seizures. Right now, we use the same drugs to treat whether the, the focal seizure is caused by a trauma or caused by a genetic uh, mutation. In the future, our treatments will be more tailored, I think, to the underlying cause of the epilepsy. And the hope is that that will make them more effective for more people. Okay. Uh, so we went through this, and I just wanted to emphasize again that um, part of the pathway, the, the, the journey that people go through with epilepsy, is to determine whether their seizures are drug resistant or not. Um, often, with the very first drug that's tried, people can become seizure free. That's a wonderful outcome. Sometimes it takes another drug or a, a new combination of drugs to make people seizure free. Again, a wonderful outcome over half of people with epilepsy can find seizure freedom. Uh, they may be dealing with some other issues, but seizures can be controlled with some of these medications. However, for a, a large number of people with epilepsy, their, treatment, uh, their seizures are treatment resistant. And when you get to that treatment resistant category, that treatment resistant diagnosis, that's when we start to think about many of these other options for treatment for people with epilepsy. So different types of uh, new drugs, different types of uh, neurostimulation or neuromodulation, surgical interventions, dietary therapies, um, any of these things are, are typically considered the next line of therapy with uh, drug-resistant epilepsy. And it's important to note that the uh, you know, quote-unquote cure that we have in the epilepsy field really is coming from right now surgical approaches or dietary therapies. Um, most of their uh, uh, treatments really control the seizures, but they don't eliminate them, um, with the exception of surgical approaches and sometimes diet. So those are important things to try if the first medications that you've tried have, have failed. And we'll come back to the idea that uh, Trying a new therapy in a, in a clinical trial should also be one of the options that are considered when someone reaches that drug-resistant epilepsy stage. Okay. So I'll make the point that, uh, again, most of the current therapies control the seizures. The drugs work while you're taking them. If you forget to take them, if you stop taking them for some reason, um, they the seizures tend to return. In, uh, in the future, what we hope is that the treatments that will work on the underlying cause of the epilepsy will also actually change the way that epilepsy is expressed. So it might make uh, seizures less frequent, it might make seizures less severe, or it might eliminate seizures entirely so that you could take this treatment for a period of time and eliminate the seizures um, entirely. That's our hope for the future, and it's not a, a terribly distant future in, in some cases. Um, and this is called disease-modifying therapy. 
So here I wanted to share with you the, the typical uh, graphic that shows the pipeline of drug development. Um, and this is true for development of uh, as devices as well as drugs, but I'll talk here uh, specifically more about drugs. Um, ideas often will come from a basic research study are getting uh, a better understanding of why epilepsy develops in certain people um, or even sometimes in certain animal models of epilepsy. And there are many for that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we, uh, as, a, as a foundation, as a community, really advocate for funding for research at the National Institutes of Health. They are the premier, uh, premier agency that supports basic research into human biology. Um, and so that's one of the reasons if we want new therapies, we have to have a better understanding of why epilepsy develops in the brain in the first place. So with some of those new insights from basic uh, research, that concept can move along this pipeline, being uh, translated into a, a potential therapy, and that's often called translational research. And then after going through a number of uh, important tests, the FDA may approve a clinical trial of a new potential therapy. Those, therapy, uh, those clinical trials are often broken into three different stages uh, or more. There's some substages here, but we'll keep it simple. Um, a phase one, if it's a new uh, chemical entity that's never been before in people, the, the FDA and, and investigators are very cautious about exposing people to brand new chemical entities. And so that is tried in a very small number of people, often uh, people without any disease uh, process. And that way we get a sense of how does this new chemical entity work in the body um, under, under quote unquote typical conditions. Once a drug has been shown to be safe enough in a phase one study, it can then move on to a phase two study. And this is getting a little bit more sophisticated, a little larger number of people, usually people who have the disease that uh, is, is being tested for. Phase two clinical trials, the goal there is to really get more information about safety, but also to see uh, whether there are Im indications about what kind of dose uh, should be tried for, what kinds of uh, markers will change with and without this, this uh, new chemical entity on board, and whether or not you can see any signal of any help at all. Um, this is not the definitive uh, trial that comes next in phase three, but phase two studies, you generally would like to see things moving in the right direction uh, in a smaller group of people. So once you have successful phase two trials, then you can move on to phase three. And phase three is really considered the definitive uh, study of safety and efficacy. This means uh, the entity has been tried in a larger number of people. Um, that is, uh, the number is powered, uh, that's a clinical trial term, powered to show whether or not there's a difference in outcome between people in uh, the intervention arm or people in the usual care arm. And uh, so phase three trials are ones where we are quite close to getting an answer about whether this new therapy is going to be beneficial for people with epilepsy. And once a phase three trial has been concluded, uh, typically there are at least two done for, uh, for uh, new, new therapies to be approved. There are some uh, exceptions to that rule, particularly for rare disorders um, that, uh, you can, sorry, my son is handing me a note in the middle. Um, so typically uh, there are two definitive phase three trials that are required before FDA will approve a therapy uh, moving into the clinic. However, in the case of rare disorders, orphan diseases, uh, things like that, there can be some expedited pathways to get uh, promising therapies into the clinic more quickly. So assuming that the FDA has reviewed all of the evidence and concludes that the new entity is safe and effective, and effective for the treatment that it's been uh, developed for and tested in, then they will make a, a new drug approval and release uh, this new drug into the clinic. And once it gets into the clinic, it can be used in a, a larger pool of people hopefully, and for the most part, uh, in alignment with the indication, although physicians do have 
uh, the opportunity to prescribe uh, what is called off-label. And for many folks in our pediatric community and in the rare community, they're very familiar with off-label prescribing because many of the, the treatments that we try for folks who have difficult to, to control epilepsy um, have not necessarily been tested in that exact uh, situation, but we've got to try something. And so that's one of the ways that uh, we can begin to have a sense of whether this uh, compound has a, a larger effect in a, in a more generalizable group of people when it's tested in the clinic. One of the reasons that I'm so passionate about uh, developing the epilepsy learning healthcare system is so that all of that experience that we get from the everyday treatment that people is, are getting in the clinic can create a set of data that we can learn from. Um, this is a very, very powerful opportunity to learn so that others don't have to go through the same uh, odyssey of you know, failures in different uh, drug regimens. If we can learn what works more quickly, we can benefit uh, people uh, and get them to a better level of seizure control more quickly. So again, the take home point that uh, we only get new therapies when people are willing to volunteer for clinical trials. So it's an important thing to think about in your day. Okay, I know you have a session on uh, rescue therapies and seizure action plans a little later in the conference, so I won't spend too much time, but I did wanna make the point that there, these are new rescue therapies that have been approved very recently. Um, in the past, the only rescue therapy that was uh, approved for, uh, uh, for epilepsy was rectal diastat. And for obvious reasons, many people were resistant uh, to using that. However, these new rescue therapies have different uh, uh, application. And so I think that it's very important everyone know that they are available. You can be talking to your doctor about whether a rescue therapy is appropriate for you or your child. Um, and of course, this uh, rescue therapy should be embedded into your seizure action plan and everyone should have a seizure action plan. If you don't have one, there's a link there. Uh, we've got multiple different uh, templates, things that you can just fill in online, um, things that will work for school, things that will work for an employer. I encourage you, if you don't have one, to develop a seizure action plan with your doctor. Okay, um, we have had a number of anti-seizure medicines approved recently, and I just listed a few here. This I, I don't pretend to be a, an exhaustive list, but you can see that several are specifically indicated for folks with rare epilepsy syndromes. Uh, Lennox Gasto, Dravet, tuberous sclerosis have each had uh, new uh, drugs approved for them. Um, I believe, and Karen, if you're still on the line, you can correct me, we've also had a new drug approved for CDKL5. Uh, very recently, and that was uh, just in the last, I think, month or so. Um, and so uh, more and more of the rare disorders are, ha are having uh, new treatments in development and, and approved, which is fantastic news. Okay, uh, and this was just to remind us that in the drugs in development, they are typically working on that etiology as opposed to the seizure type. Um, learning why you have epilepsy, why your child has epilepsy is important today. Even uh, if we weren't getting these great new treatments based on etiology, I would be telling you, learn what the cause of your epilepsy is if you can, because there are potentially treatable epilepsies that uh, have very specific treatment based on what that underlying cause is or that metabolic syndrome or that genetic uh, underlying uh, variation. And this is just a, a brief table from uh, Ann Paduri, who's one of a, a, our fantastic uh, clinician scientists in the field, to share that when uh, epilepsy can be attributed to these genetic conditions, there are specific treatments that will work uh, better than others for those, those conditions. Okay, so here, and again, not an exhaustive list, um, but there are a number of anti-seizure medicines in development for rare diseases. And one of the things, and I think Karen mentioned this in her comments earlier, one of the things that can really help you with a rare disease specific group is that those groups are on the pulse of the clinical trials that are happening for their community. Very often the, um, the uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies will work directly with patient advocacy groups to design the trial, uh, to get feedback on, uh, you know, 
whether the, the way that they're thinking about administering the drug is feasible, um, it will be acceptable to people with that particular condition. And so getting involved in uh, the patient advocacy community can help you not just from a support standpoint, but also from uh, the, the pers perspective of learning what is new and available in your rare disease um, as quickly as possible. Okay, so at this point, um, I hope we're doing okay on time. I wanted to just give you a little bit of insight into how some of the trials for rare epilepsies are changing. And this is incredibly exciting to me, at least. Um, and the reason it's exciting to me is that in a, in a condition like tuberous sclerosis, and tuberous sclerosis is a genetic condition, uh, very complex, lots of organ systems involved, and it tends to be a, a cause um, caused by mutations in two different genes. One is the uh, mTOR, uh, uh, one or two genes, and that then sets up a, a situation where you have abnormal cell growth in different systems, including the brain. Um, and so we know what the genetic cause is. We know what some of the uh, cellular and physiological impacts are. And we know that for people with epilepsy, uh, people with tuberous sclerosis, epilepsy is a very common um, symptom of, of TS. So overall, about 90% of people with tuberous sclerosis complex have epilepsy. Um, and for more than half of those people, that seizures, those seizures began before 12 months of age. So it happens very early on. And as we talked about, having seizures in the developmental period um, can have some pretty devastating impacts for long-term cognitive function and development. 65% uh, have seizures before 12 months of age, 60% have intellectual disability, and 50% have other comorbid kinds of conditions, behavioral comorbidities, um, autism, other psychiatric issues. So this slide is, um, was uh, uh, given to me by Martina Bebin, who is, again, a fantastic clinician scientist, uh, largely in the tuberous sclerosis treatment community um, at the University of Alabama. And Martina has developed a study called the PREVENT trial. Um, this study is brand new because it uses the opportunity to know who has, you know, which babies have a TSC mutation. Have they developed seizures yet or not yet? Can we watch the development of their brain to see which way uh, they might be going if their brain is moving into the, into the uh, propensity to have spontaneous seizures? And when we start to see that, can we try intervening early? much earlier than we would normally um, when we wait until those seizures develop. And so this uh, study that she developed is called the PREVENT trial. And it really uh, is, I think, a totally different way to approach dealing with seizures in a rare uh, epilepsy. Because she's testing, if we, prevent, if we uh, administer therapy, and in this case, it's the standard uh, therapy for infants with TSC, Vigabitrin, but if we give that vigabitrin to infants, even before the seizures are observable, as soon as we start to see abnormal EEG activity in, in the brain, can we prevent the seizures from actually developing? Can we improve their uh, growth and developmental scores? Can we improve their uh, cognitive scores when they're uh, two and three years old? So this trial is going on right now. Uh, I believe they, are, they have finished their enrollment. They've enrolled all of the uh, subjects into this trial, and they are now following those, those kids up for their final assessments. And we expect that the results of the trial will be uh, announced, that, I think, within the, the coming year. So this is very exciting. And um, the, the uh, design here is in front of you on the, on the screen. I won't go through it uh, just for time, but it's really a, a new way to think about uh, preventing seizures rather than treating them once they've already developed. Okay, and I will finish up by uh, encouraging you that if you're interested in looking for clinical trials in epilepsy, there's a great tool developed uh, and available called clinicaltrials.gov. 
If you just Google clinicaltrials.gov, you'll be able to get to this search tool. And just very quickly, I threw in the terms epilepsy or seizures uh, into the search engine recently, and it came up with uh, 557 uh, studies that were either active, recruiting, uh, about to recruit, and uh, looked at this across the globe. Now, this is not a pristine search. There's, there's probably a few in there that are um, not relevant, but the point is there are studies going on for epilepsy and seizures all across the world. And for those of you in the rare community, looking at what's happening in other parts of the world can be really informative. There's um, tremendous research efforts in rare epilepsies going on in Europe, in Australia, um, many other parts of the world. And so that can be a good place to, to understand what's happening and what may be available for you. You can also drill down into specific regions of uh, the world and just a quick map of what is available in the United States. Takeaway here is there are not, uh, clinical trials are not evenly distributed across the country, just like you might expect. So if there isn't a study going on uh, very near you, take a look at, at other parts of the country. There are ways now, uh, especially with the um, rise in telemedicine, that sometimes folks can be enrolled uh, remotely. And so that there might be an opportunity, even if the study is not uh, particularly enrolling at a, at a center that is right near you, a way that you might be able to have like a single visit at the, at the main site and then be re uh, monitored remotely. Um, in your in your area. So encourage people to take a look at clinicaltrials.gov. There's a lot of educational material, some videos, um, what are good questions to ask about being involved in a clinical trial? How do you understand the risks and the benefits of being involved in a clinical trial? And that's a great resource um, for folks who are considering clinical studies. And finally, I'll just end up, uh, and I'm sure you've seen a slide like this before, um, acknowledging the amazing work of the Rare Epilepsy Network and all of the uh, caregivers and leaders who are um, helping to move the field forward in the rare epilepsy space. And we're very lucky and honored to partner with them. I'll finally uh, share with you two quotes from two of my favorite philosophers, Confucius and Bob Marley. <laughs> um, and I think about the, the quote from Kip Confucius, when I think about learning healthcare systems, um, the greatest glory is not in never falling, but rising every time we fall. And then I think about parents and caregivers and people with epilepsy. When I think about Bob Marley's quote, you never know how strong you are when, until being strong is your only choice. So I'll finish there and turn it over to Dr. Warnicke. And then afterwards, I hope we will have a little bit of time for some questions and uh, some great discussion. So thank you so much for your attention and I will stop my share. Okay, thank you. Glenn, back to you. I, I'm already just ready to run and just hear you all in this discussion. That was amazing. Thank you for framing the discussion so well and for bringing us along. Uh, giving us some insight into a research scientist's mind. Uh, and boy, do we only have a little bit of what you got. Thank you so much for uh, your strong leadership. I want to introduce Dr. Peter Warnicke now uh, to be able to share uh, what is also next and happening in the world of neurosurgery. Uh, Dr. Warnicke has uh, an impressive resume, including doing work uh, that is rarely done. And so we're so grateful uh, that he is in the upper Midwest region out of Chicago. Dr. Warnicke, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. My, <clears throat> entirely my pleasure. Uh, let us see whether I can do the share screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, we see your desktop. Okay. That's, and here comes your slide good. deck now. And here we go. Okay. Good. Let's go in presentation mode. Is that good? Looks great. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Good. I'll, uh, I'll take you uh, through the latest things in epilepsy surgery. And uh, if it's a little bit longer, then it's all Aisha's fault because she emailed me yesterday that she wants to see the latest results, which I just collected from my lab. So uh, 
But it's great <clears throat> information. It, it is, and it is fit so perfectly because if I wouldn't have heard it before, I would have framed the new expression by uh, Dr. Furman. We are moving indeed from controlling to modifying epilepsy. And uh, I, I think my, my talk, uh, my take home messages are, uh, I'll take you through a little tour from resective ablative neurosurgery to uh, neuromodulation and uh, indeed modifying actually the brain via very intricate surgical means. And what this has led to already, and there's one paper came out last week, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, called Paradigm Shifts in Neurosurgery. And I think our concept of neurosurgery or epilepsy surgery is going to change dramatically. The idea that there are surgical cases and non-surgical cases, and the surgical ones are focal and the non-surgical ones are multifocal or generalized, is actually obsolete. Even generalized epilepsy now has very good surgical approaches with very well researched rational uh, ways of affecting generalized epilepsy. That's one thing. Uh, and we can actually uh, very focally intervene in very generalized epilepsy and stop seizures. And uh, that, that's the exciting part. And we're doing a couple of clinical trials, but experimental stuff uh, from my lab. So I will, I will show you that. The overall problem with epilepsy surgery is unfortunately in the last 30 years unsolved. And that is a tragedy that it is entirely underused. Uh, as we just heard correctly, the real way to cure of epilepsy in drug resistant uh, cases is surgery, which offers really the hope of cure. We know that uh, it, the, it comes with, or it came, I have to say, with a bit of a price, but it was cure. And uh, we are in the United States performing about 2000, 2500 epilepsy surgeries in completely worked up patients where there's a very reasonable predictive score of cure. And the patient pool from the US population alone, where this could be applied is about 20,000 patients. So we are actually not even hitting the tip of the iceberg. It's less than that 10% of patients that are candidates for surgery and potential cure really get surgery. So that's, I think, what, what we need to change. So I'll, I'll uh, go through this and I will start with uh, our new approaches towards resection, which have completely changed. And then we go to network modification, uh, which we're studying right now in, in different types of epilepsies and uh, including Lennox, Gusto, et cetera. So the, these are my disclosures. So I, I have funding from the uh, <coughs> NIH Brain Initiative from the uh, Translational Science, uh, University of Chicago funding, Michael J. Fox, et cetera. And uh, I'm the associate editor of the uh, Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry. The industry funding you see down there, there's not a single penny going to myself, unfortunately. That's all funding of uh, clinical studies and goes to my, to my research lab. So the the interesting thing about surgery and what drove innovation in terms of finding better, minimally invasive, less aggressive ways with equivalent efficacy comes from this hallmark study from Christoph Hamstetter from the Bonn Group. Uh, because you could ask, why are we talking about epilepsy surgery, particularly in temporal lobe epilepsy, which is the most common one? Uh, we have already a cure. It's taking out the temporal lobe, anterior temporal lobectomy, or if you want to be very sophisticated, do a selective amygdala hippocampectomy, SAH. That is all true, and it is uh, a curative procedure in about 70 to 65% of patients. There are two big drawbacks of this. Number one is, uh, as you can see, if you do an uh, anterior temporal lobectomy and you look at the learning and the memory, pre and post-operative, you see you will have a deficit. 
your learning will be impaired and your memory will be impaired. And the worst is over the years, if you follow these patients up to five years, then your memory decline is actually progressive. If you do a very selective procedure, only taking out the amygdala, the hippocampus, the temporal mesial structures, you avoid the learning problem, but you still have a memory issue. Only if you have a very rare case, a lateral lesion, a little benign tumor where you don't connect the mesial structures with the lateral ones, then you can get away neuropsychology. So there is a curative treatment available since the 1960s, but it has a price. And that drove innovation because we wanted to develop treatments that are as effective or even maybe more effective, but we don't have to pay this price in terms of neuropsychological uh, deficits. The other thing is about big resective epilepsy surgery is if you follow these patients for long enough, the data for cure 70% patients seizure-free, that's after three years and five years. If you follow the patients for 10 years, it actually goes down very slowly, but it goes down to about 50%. So that was the birth of uh, something that people have tried, particularly in France, with heating procedures. They used radio frequency, other stuff, where they just selectively heated the structures which have been evaluated before by stereo EG, where we know the seizure onset zone was, and just destroy this by heat. The problem is with radio frequency, you cannot scan simultaneously and laser completely revolutionized the field because you can see what you're doing whilst you're doing it. By scanning the patient continuously whilst you make the lesion, you can uh, get a heat map. You can see our, on A, the temperature map, uh, color coded, and B, you see the damage zone. That's the volume of tissue that has been heated up to 70 degrees Celsius where you have immediate cell death. And you know this is very precise because on D, you can see the immediate scan done 60 seconds after the laser ablation conforms precisely to what we predict where the lesion would be. And C just shows you how we evaluated these patients up front with multiple uh, electrodes to identify the seizure onset zone. So this was a major change in epilepsy surgery for temporal lobe epilepsy. And it works very well. This is the uh, paper from 2019 from several centers putting all their patients together using one fiber. Uh, which basically goes to the lengths axis of all these uh, structures that we are known are very epileptogenic. And this is a large group, 234 patients. What you can see is how they process their images and uh, predict it based on this, then the outcome, which is a positive predictive and a negative predictive value map. What this basically shows, it's just a heat map the more red, the better it is in terms of prediction that tells you which parts of the temporal lobe mesial structures needed to be ablated to make the patient seizure free. And uh, that was interesting, but they focused on the amygdala and the hippocampus. And the outcomes were interestingly as good as uh, temporal lobectomy if you had HS, which is hippocampal sclerosis, the most common cause of temporal mesial epilepsy. If you didn't have that, but still then the outcomes were a little bit less. But uh, one thing that we can also see is whilst you start with, with both groups, almost 70% uh, or 68% seizure freedom after six months, then it goes down after 12, a little bit more after 18 and then it roughly stabilizes. We now have five year outcome data from the large groups. The largest is the group in Pennsylvania, Emory and us. And after five years, you end up in the range of anterior, uh, anterior temporal lobectomy indeed of about 50%, 55% if you use one fiber. 
So the next step with this was to find better predictive values and maybe try to conform the lesioning by using multiple fibers. And this came out of our lab. This is uh, David Setzer's work, a researcher in my lab, where we actually wanted to look in our laser ablation patients, not in the hippocampus, but we all know that the outflow, all of the fibers and the way the seizures are spread to the rest of the brain goes through a structure underneath the hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex. And we segmented uh, this out and then looked how much of the entorhinal cortex did we ablate and how was that predictive for seizure outcome? And it turned out it was extremely predictive an independent prognostic variable. So, but this cannot be reached with one line, with one fiber. And this led to the uh, creation of a new approach, the two trajectory uh, fiber. And this is from the uh, Univers uh, Brown University group from uh, Well Assad uh, and David Liu, who's one of our coworkers, who then found out that you can actually get all these structures, including the entorhinal cortex, by implanting two fibers, one from an oblique angle, one from a straight angle from behind. And uh, this is how they modeled this. You can see uh, on the scans, they used two different uh, fibers, one coming from the side and one coming from the back. And they just started their study and uh, have some interesting outcome data. It's too early to say, but all the patients they have treated with uh, two fibers actually have become angle class one, so they are seizure free. Interestingly, uh, both the Emory group has adapted that. We do this also, and all the patients that have failed or have re failed either laser ablation or have recurrent seizures after five years, we've offered this approach and put a second fiber in and ablated selectively the entorhinal cortex and touch wood so far, all of them are seizure free. So this could be a complete game changer because it might increase the uh, cure rate above that of classic epilepsy surgery, uh, i.e. Uh, temporal lobectomy. Even if it would only be the same as classical standard, temporal lobectomy, there's a huge, huge advantage of doing it minimally invasively with the laser fiber. And that's the cognitive outcomes. And I'll show you our outcomes. So if you look at uh, particularly memory testing, uh, delayed verbal memory, this is our whole group in, uh, you see in blue is before the uh, selective laser mechalacophectomy in red after, except for one patient there's no significant change. So none of the changes uh, that you see after temporal lobectomy occur here. And there's a reason for that. Same with uh, visual memory. And most importantly, and that's where people were afraid of uh, because we're opening the blood brain barrier, cause a little bit of edema, executive functioning, no changes, if anything, actually improvement in that. And the reason is that we are not disrupting the connection between the temporal mesial structures and the uh, lateral temporal lobe via the temporal stem. So as we stand right now, and actually we are studying this and we're, I'm going coming to the studies uh, in the end, uh, it looks like we are using a selective, very focused, precise, MRI guided approach, we are as good, potentially better, but without the price that you have to pay if you use open epilepsy surgery. The next interesting thing is um, we used source localization, which is a complex EEG mathematical modeling to not only find the seizure onset from the surface EEG, a lot of groups have been doing this, but a particular group in Nancy has started to do this from stereo EG, from actually implanted electrodes. And that is a completely different world because if you put electrodes on the head, you have a rough idea where the seizures come from and you don't have it in three dimensional space. If you put a lot of these electrodes like uh, on the lower left, deep into the brain, and each of these electrodes has eight to 12 contacts, 
you have a huge number of electrodes in a three-dimensional space. And if you then apply the mathematical modeling, you can figure out very precisely, even if the MRI looks totally normal, where your seizure onset zone is and where you need to either resect, ablate with a laser, or have to modulate using, for example, the responsive neurostimulation system. And that has huge clinical implications. This is a typical example where the standard without source localization neurosurgery would do what's called a lesionectomy. You see on the, uh, on the left, this is a small contrast enhancing uh, lesion here, which turns out to be, it's a benign tumor, so-called DNET, uh, dysembryoblastic neuroepithelial tumor, uh, very benign, very common in children. The problem is, uh, or you can ask, I uh, won't take the suspense away. This is a tiny lesion, very easy if you find it and target it precisely to resect. This should take care of the epilepsy. But then why on earth did we do this extensive resection here? As you can see, we took quite a lot of brain out. And the reason is this. This is the EEG source localization from the same patient. We can see on the surface how large the, this is the so-called dipoles, how large the distribution is. If you project it on the brain here, you can see the actual seizure onset zone is much, much larger than just the lesion. So a pure lesionectomy taking out the tumor would have not rendered this patient seizure free because the actual seizures came from the surrounding irritated brain by the tumor. And taking out the tumor alone does not because these are longstanding epilepsy cases, not going to solve the problem. So in this case, as you can see, this extensive resection was informed by the actual individual patient physiology and the seizure onset zone as characterized by the source localization. And uh, this is a <coughs> interesting case. Uh, this is then taking this to the next level where we have patients where we perform so-called functional hemispherectomies. These are huge surgeries. This is 99%. It's either after an inflammation or after a stroke during uh, birth. And uh, these patients have horrible seizures, catastrophic, multiple seizures per day, completely medically uh, resistant we then performed open surgeries and separated basically the two hemispheres. And those were surgeries with a clear risk profile, very effective, 80% seizure freedom, but a complication rate of at least 10 to 15%, including hydrocephalus uh, infections, etc. And uh, the Boston Children's Group, uh, deserves the credit. They um, were the first ones in a child uh, and a two-year-old where they actually did this via a laser by putting multiple laser fibers in and disconnecting the brain anatomically. And that worked fine. We have taken this a uh, step further and uh, we've now done two cases with more than a year outcome, both of them seizure-free and we're doing the next one in two weeks. But we have taken a slightly different approach. We actually target the individual fibers of these patients. You see these little orange spots here. This is what's called DTI, then tensor diffusion imaging. This is the fiber tracts, which we know are functionally intact. So we're not targeting just the MRI. We are targeting the intact fiber structures and we are guiding and shaping the laser ablation according to that. And the next image shows you the actual procedure. What you see on the left side is the temperature map. It shows you where the temperature distributes in the brain with continuous MRI scanning. And on the right side, then you see the shape of the laser lesion. And if you remember these fibers that I've shown you on the previous image were distributed differently. There were widespread fibers at the bottom, then it became very slim and then it became larger when it went higher up to the motor cortex. And you can see this is the first lesion we made. We always test them uh, uh, with a low power to see where the temperature distributes. And the next lesion should be extremely tight because that's 
where there were very, very few fibers. And we only want to damage the relevant fibers, not the surrounding brain. And you see, we made this uh, very tight lesion and then it gets more widespread and we made a larger lesion. And then the final one, when it gets to the cortex where the fibers all spread uh, and you need a relatively large volume to be ablated is done uh, at the very end. So what this shows basically is you can, if you study the physiology of the patient with these modern functional imaging techniques, yeah, you can actually make the lesion according to the individual physiology of the patient. And as we're talking about rare epilepsies, this is another application of this technique where we do, did this in cavernomas. These are benign vascular lesions, which unfortunately bleed and in the majority cause epilepsies. And you can take those out, which carries the risk of open surgery, or uh, you can also use a laser. And these uh, lesions have a lot of hemosiderin, uh, which means iron in it. And that actually convex the heat much better than normal brain. So they're very, very nice and easy to ablate. And as you can see from our outcomes, uh, basically all of our patients, uh, except for one who still has some RS, are seizure free without any, any side effects. And moving from these more focal procedures to another procedure that again, where we did for decades, I at least, uh, risky open procedures with good efficacy. Uh, this is in Lennox Gastaut patients where we performed callosotomies, particularly to stop the uh, drop attacks, which led to injury in a lot of patients. And this is an effective procedure known since decades. You can reduce the drop attacks by at least 80%, which is very significant clinically but it's a major open surgery. You have to split the two hemispheres of the brain. There are some very critical vessels running in this area. And uh, we were actually the first group who used the laser for this, two laser fibers, as you can see in this, and just did the whole uh, dissection of the corpus callosum, the connection between the left and the right hemisphere using laser fibers. And, uh, after the proof of principle uh, and showing how nicely you can ablate with two fibers, uh, 70 to 80% of the whole connections. Uh, we looked at this and as you can see our outcome were uh, not only as good, actually they were even better. 50% of our patients had a complete uh, stop of their drop attacks and the other ones were in the range of uh, about 50 and 80 percent so uh which is extremely helpful for these these patients so this leads us more into the generalized epilepsy so to conclude i think in focal resective epilepsy we have much more refined better tools now than the classic standard um approaches they are at least as effective, but the side effect profile is much more favorable. Which brings us to the former non-surgical cases, the generalized epilepsy patients, where uh, there was no open surgical resection. And that's where neuromodulation kicked in. And some of you might, might know that the first trial was the deep brain stimulation trial, the Sante trial, where electrodes, which we use since decades in for movement disorder, were actually put into parts of the thalamus, uh, the anterior thalamic nucleus, and permanent stimulation was carried out. The rationale behind this was seminal work actually done in uh, Mexico and in, in Cuba, where people recorded seizure activity from these structures and made ablations there, just heat lesions, and that led to improvement of seizures. And what you can see, this is the long-term outcome data published in Neurology 2015, is uh, interestingly, you get a seizure reduction, but exactly the opposite of what you see in classic resective epilepsy surgery, where the effect gets a little bit less over years or you have more seizure recurrence here it's the opposite 
you compare one year and five year, the bars become longer down and the minus means less seizures. So this treatment actually gets better over the years if you chronically stimulate these areas, which already raised an interesting hypothesis. How can that be? If you don't change the treatment at all, how can it slowly get better after years? And the theory was there must be something happening in the brain if you chronically stimulate in these networks and uh, that induces neuroplasticity, changes the network connectivity, and that must be the uh, long-term effect, which would mean if you extrapolate, maybe in 10 years, it's even better. And uh, likewise, we're not only interested in reducing seizures, uh, this uh, Sante trial looked at uh, quality of life uh, improvement from baseline and the uh, uh, Liverpool seizure um, severity. And as you can see, the same thing. Uh, there's improvement that gets better and better after uh, year after year, up to five years. So that was very, very encouraging. The problem with the current DBS, uh, which is FDA approved, is that these batteries don't last forever. You need to exchange them. And the question is, do we really need to continuously uh, stimulate the brain, the thalamus, or can we do it only to stop the seizure when the seizure happens? And uh, this is, by the way, how it's done. You put these electrodes very deep into the brain. They have to be very, very precise. But uh, we do this for movement disorders all the time. So it's technically feasible. It's a very low risk procedure. You just have to be uh, within a millimeter precise. So the first uh, interesting paper in this came out in 2018 to test this hypothesis. If really getting patients better every year are we changing the network what what is actually happening what makes the patient stop seizing when we stimulate these very discrete areas in the in the deep brain structures which we know are part of a network and what happened is that was uh, done by a uh, chinese group in collaboration with mayo is they put a lot of electrodes into different parts of the brain for stereo EG evaluation for a clinical indication, and then put the deep brain stimulator electrode in. And whenever they turned it on versus off, what you can see is uh, stim ANT is the actual treatment electrode is all this noise here immediately stops. And then you turn it off and it comes back. But it only works in this structure because we know it is network related. What they then did, which is very interesting, they did what's called functional resting state MRI, where when they look at the connectivity of brain structures continuously with stimulation on and off. And what you can see is whenever you turn it on, the connectivity goes down. Off, it goes up. On, it goes down. So basically what deep brain stimulation with permanent stimulation does, it stops connecting the brains via these networks. And that stops the seizures from spreading and becoming clinically manifest, which is uh, the proof of principle here. So that brings us to the question, do we have to chronically stimulate the brain or can we just stimulate when we sense there's a seizure coming and how do we sense it? And that's where responsive uh, neurostimulation, short RNS, came into play which basically uh, records from the brain, has a uh, basically a mini uh, personal computer implanted with a chip into the bone, uh, the convexity of the brain, which analyzes EEG patterns. And you can program from the outside with a computer which EEG pattern you want to trigger the stimulation. So when you define this is a sequence that shows me there's a seizure building up. You let the system fire and stop the seizure before it turns into one, basically, uh, which has two big advantages. You don't need to chronically stimulate the brain, which has a little bit of a side effect around the electrodes that can cause gliosis, and then it becomes less effective. Plus, the other big advantage is 
you don't need to use much battery power because you only stimulate when needed. And this is how it's done. You also implant electrodes in this uh, study in a different part of the circuitry. The circuit that connects the epilepsy uh, networks is always through the central median nucleus or the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Those are easily identified by stereotactic neurosurgeons. And uh, you can do uh, then measure exactly the activity and you can measure seizure activity in the thalamus if the patient has a surface EEG on as well. And uh, this is the first paper, hot off the press. Um, this is from Mark Richardson from uh, MGH, who is uh, one of our collaborators. And I took this out of his paper and uh, I'm allowed to do that because actually this is from journal Neurology, Neurosurgery, Psychiatry. So I was the editor. Uh, and what this paper shows is the proof of principle in, uh, in four patients, which they follow long-term. Um, you can see on the upper panel where the electrodes are inserted. And you can see basically, this is the EG. You see the seizure build up, then the stimulus is given, and then the seizure slows down. So, and if you look at their outcomes, uh, it's fabulous. These are people with generalized medically refractory epilepsy uh, that uh, had multiple, multiple seizures a day and their angle class is fantastic. So the key message is, is it's really effective for drug resistant focal epilepsy and generalized epilepsy. And um, though it is retrospective and we're doing a prospective trial at this time, it's uh, a very promising uh, new treatment modality. We, and uh, this is really new stuff from our lab, we have been doing this as well and actually have more patients uh, than in the MGH group at this point. And we actually, because we can record continuously for 60 days via these devices, we can, during the day when the patient is at home, record and look what happens actually to their overall EG activity, to their seizure um, circadian rhythms, and what happens if you have them stop the seizures via responsive neurostimulation over a couple of months to their brain activity in the circuitry. And again, this is work by uh, David Setz from our group. And uh, this is rather fascinating. What you can see L1, L3 are the electrodes on the contacts on the left side, R13 is on the right side. What you can see is the blue line is before we turned it on, the system implanted. And then we looked at seven months later, uh, which is the red line. And what you can see is in this gray bar, there's a high, uh, there's a frequency band with high activity in the range of 10 to 15 hertz, which is the activity band uh, which, via which the epilepsy network communicates. The thing is then after seven months, this is massively reduced, both on the left and the right side. And it's reduced regardless of whether you stimulate, the stimulation is on or not. The majority of the time during the day, the stimulation is off. And that is indeed a very strong hint that by doing this neuromodulation in the deep basal ganglia, you are modulating the epilepsy network. And that means you are inducing neuroplasticity. You are changing the connectivity of the brain and by that modulate the way that seizures can spread and stop them, make, that, make it harder for the seizure to spread. So we're really changing brain connectivity with these new treatments. So where, where are we going? Uh, coming back to resection, we are moving to way more sophisticated MRI-based procedures. Now we have uh, multiple uh, laser systems, including a robot in the MRI scanner. We don't even have to go in anymore. We can change the position of the electrode. And we can integrate functional imaging. This white here is the fiber track. These are the motor fibers. And this is a lesion that we wanted to ablate. And of course, then if you incorporate that, you can set temperature margins, make absolutely sure that you don't hit any motor fibers, cause any uh, deficit in these patients. 
So it's getting more and more sophisticated. We are incorporating more physiological uh, data, electrophysiological data into our surgical planning, which is all three-dimensional MRI image guide these days. The next thing is uh, I've shown you the RNS data, which currently is only FDA approved for adults. Uh, well, we're doing the response trial, which has started. And we're doing this also in children age 12 to 17. Uh, they have to have disabling motor simple partial complex and secondary generalized seizures, no more than two epileptogenic regions, because currently we can only put two electrodes in. We have both four contacts each, no primary generalized seizures. And this is the study that's currently open for adolescents age 12 to 17 to study in a clinical. Uh, controlled trial, the phenomena that I've just shown you and uh, which look so very promising. We've also just started the uh, Nautilus trial, which is fascinating. Uh, this is actually for patients, both uh, children age 12 up to adults age 65 that have idiopathic generalized seizures. So these patients that were traditionally non-surgical candidates or vagus nerve stimulator candidates, uh, although the efficacy in truly idiopathic generalized is relatively low in VNS patients, these patients now can enroll into this trial and get their RNS implantation again in the central median nucleus of the thalamus. And the study endpoint is safety and efficacy, uh, but the secondary endpoints are we will get all these physiological information and we will then in a very large group clearly be able to show whether we can really induce neuroplasticity and change in a, in a nutshell the wiring of the epilepsy network with this uh, treatment. So this is for a really important po patient population which was classically regarded as non-surgical candidates. And we also still do the uh, SLATE trial, which is stereotactic laser ablation for temporal lobe epilepsy, now with these two fibers, which I've shown you, which show much better results. And that trial is still open for patients with uh, generalized epilepsy. And uh, we're happy to enroll anybody who's interested. Uh, this is a limited number of centers because you need some experience with this technique, but uh, it's still open, and uh, so the completion date is now moved to May 2023, actually. So all these trials are done at the University of Chicago, and uh, we're happy to see any patient who's interested. The important point here that I'd like to stress is if you want more information, just go on our website, and you can actually, we have for all these different procedures and studies, we have videos that take you step by step through it. Uh, but the important thing is, and that makes it a little bit different from the rest of the uh, Midwest, uh, on most of the US, to be honest, we, we're actually the only comprehensive epilepsy center. And uh, that means we don't have a pediatric epilepsy center level four and an adult epilepsy. We have all under one roof because our pediatric children's hospital is part of the university hospital. And uh, both our eight uh, pediatric epileptologists and uh, seven adult epileptologists, we're sitting in the same conference. All patients are discussed. And there's no surprises if a patient who has epilepsy since the age of seven or turns 18 and then needs to find a new epileptologist. It, there's a very smooth transition. And uh, I think that is very important. We've just heard about uh, tuberous sclerosis, where these patients start with epilepsy. They have the, uh, the tubers and uh, undergo evaluation. And then later on, they develop um, subependymal uh, giant cell astrocytomas and need an adult neurosurgeon. This is all one continuum. And uh, we really put uh, our money where the mouth is, because uh, I'm actually both board uh, certified in pediatric and uh, in adult epilepsy surgery. So uh, I do children, adults uh, for our comprehensive center. And that's it for now.
Reggie, thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. Um, you have given me a new point, a new set of points to add to my talk, which is there is just as much happening in surgery as there is in uh, drug development. And we're really at an inflection point here too in, in uh, redefining who's a good surgical candidate, which is fantastic. Um, I, so I have the pleasure of moderating our discussion at this point, and I'd really love to see some questions coming from uh, the participants. So if you can put your questions in the chat, we will make sure that we get to them. Um, the, there was a question earlier on that, uh, Dr. Warnicke, I think you can comment on, and it was uh, something along the lines of how, how common is it to be on more than two anti-seizure medications? Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, unfortunately, way too common. As, as you know, uh, I mean, this is this is a little bit of the old dogma, and um, uh, let's let's just uh, punish our neurology colleagues uh, for that. That they don't give up, which, by the way, is um, as you know, it's the same in Parkinson's disease. These patients are getting more and more drugs until finally they realize it doesn't work. I, I think if you have failed two drugs, as you said, for the appropriate amount of time with proven serum levels. So good compliance, I think then it's no reason to look further because then your chance of becoming seizure free is going exponentially down with another drug you're adding. And let's be honest, the side effects of adding more drugs is going exponentially up. So I think it is, that's when you should really see, is there a surgical option? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, there was a question on uh, uh, how do you get tested for metabolic epilepsies or autoimmune epilepsies? And um, I can start and certainly Dr. <laughs> Dr. Warnicke, please add to this, but um, some uh, metabolic conditions could be detected even as part of newborn screening. Many metabolic conditions are, are uh, screened for in states so that uh, we can find those kids early and get them the appropriate treatment early. Um, there are ne new autoimmune um, diagnoses for epilepsy that have uh, really been evolving in the last, I would say, decade or so. And uh, the diagnostic procedures for those are getting better and better. Um, there is, uh, and Dr. Warnicke, you may want to comment on this too, a, a paraneoplastic uh, situation where someone who develops a, a, a tumor in part of their body may develop antibodies that then start to recognize some brain proteins that can lead to seizures. And so um, there are uh, improving ability to diagnose when that is the situation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, we have one colleague in our group, Dr. Dr. Shasha Wu, who is the expert on this and just published a review on this. You can get such a nice uh, antibody panel from CSF and uh, very nicely pin down if these antibodies are there. They actually go with relatively specific MRI images and MR spectroscopy. So if this falls together, then certainly, and there's very effective treatment for those. I mean, just steroids alone usually get rid of the seizures. This is one of the most treatable uh, things uh, we have. Absolutely. Great. So uh, please put some, some questions uh, or comments in the chat. We'll get to them. Um, a couple of questions that, that I had thought through even uh, ahead of our conversation. Um, you know, some of the things that uh, are important in deciding to be part of a clinical trial are whether or not you meet the inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, these are uh, features of the, the patient population that the investigators are trying to, to find that they believe will help them best interpret the results of the trial. Um, but Dr. Warnke, can you say a word or two about some of the common inclusion exclusion criteria um, that might uh, be a part of a clinical trial that someone might, might be considering, especially a surgery trial? Yeah, I mean... One of the exclusion criteria is uh, if you have a manifest uh, psychiatric disease, depression or anything, because these stimulation parameters can go either way. They can make your depression actually better. Some of them are used for this. They can also make it worse. And of course, the, uh, the uh, trial uh, design does not want to run the risk that you have to then to exclude a lot of patients and they, they, they have side effects. So they want a clean population. 
uh, the only other things is you have to fulfill really the definition of the epilepsy. So for the let's the response trial, for example, because you can put only two electrodes in, you can't have more than two foci uh, in, in adolescence. The, uh, the other trial, the SLATE trial, is selectively for patients with hippocampal sclerosis because that's, of course, the population that's the one that has the best outcome with surgery and also is the most common cause of hippocampal epilepsy. Uh, and then the age limitations if were picked at 65 for all the surgical trials, simply extrapolating from the old surgical trials we know a patient that has had epilepsy for a long time and has reached the age of 65 has a very, very low chance simply because of the duration of the epilepsy to really benefit from epilepsy surgery. Other than that, uh, the rest are basically anesthesia risks. Uh, other than that, the inclusion is very broad. Great, thank you. Uh, we got a question going back to etiology specifically for a 19-year-old testing for metabolic etiology, is there a specific panel? Um, so what I am aware of in this area is there is, uh, at least for screening genetic epilepsies, which may be metabolic, um, there, there is a, a pretty standard epilepsy panel that can be ordered. Um, for children, there is a really awesome program called Behind the Seizure, in which uh, I believe it's now children under the age of eight who have had uh, an unprovoked seizure that is not otherwise explained. Uh, so that it's not because they had a hit on the head or not because they had a small stroke, anything like that. But uh, if their seizure is unexplained, they can get genetic testing through this behind the seizures program. Um, you should be able to talk to your doctor about getting evaluated for uh, with using a genetic panel or for a metabolic screen. Um, Dr. Wernicke, anything you wanna add on that? No, I mean, that's, that's exactly our process as well, yeah. Okay. And uh, let's see, a question from Christina. Is there a minimum age for getting a surgical evaluation? Great question. That is a super question. No, there's none. And uh, there is a reason for that. I've shown you this, this child where we did the uh, hemispherectomy. The, these kids have seizures basically since birth, because they suffer a, a stroke during birth. And uh, there is no limitation. We operate four-month-old, six-month-old patients if they have catastrophic seizures. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, of course, we want to get rid of the seizures. The other reason, which is almost as important, maybe even more important, is a child during this very critical phase of development having multiple seizures a day, this stops normal brain development. So if you stop the seizures, that's already good for the child, but it is mega good because you can now normalize brain development in the surrounding brain. So the sooner you get your handle on this, the better. So there, in other words, there's no age limit. We operate as early as we can. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that, that holds true for um, getting to a comprehensive epilepsy center as quickly as possible uh, when epilepsy is affecting a child, for sure. Uh, okay. I'm not seeing any other questions coming through in the chat. Maybe one other uh, question uh, for you all in the audience. Has anyone in the audience participated in a clinical research study? Uh, and if you did, what what was your experience like? Um, would you do it again? Uh, if you haven't participated in a clinical research study, what is it that's holding you back? Um, these are important ways for us to make progress as a community. Um, as you heard, they can potentially offer benefit to you. Um, it's not a guarantee. There are always risks to consider, but uh, it is an important way for us to learn as a community and potentially to uh, bring seizure freedom to more of our of our friends in the epilepsy world. As we wait for that, um, oh, as we wait for that, uh, my question, Brandy and Dr. Warnicke, is also in this space around the surgery eligibility. And can you talk about for both uh, of your work? And I know you're mindful of this, so I'd love to have it shared with the folks here. 
when you're thinking of, about folks from uh, specific racial cultural groups and their access or knowledge of neurosurgery, can you talk about what, what you've seen be successful, uh, even starting to raise the sites of, of folks around access uh, from a racial and cultural component to accessing neurosurgery and clinical trials? Sure, Dr. Warnicke, you wanna go first and I'll follow? Yeah, I mean, that uh, being at the University of Chicago on the South Side, this is, this is of course very, very critical. And uh, it, this is a big problem. Uh, so we're trying, of course, to be totally open uh, to, to all our communities. And we have a very large African-American, also a very large Hispanic community. Uh, luckily, we are gifted uh, and, and have that, that many translation services that language, et cetera, is not, not an issue. But the cultural issue is uh, there is usually a very huge misconception about epilepsy surgery, the idea that we are opening the head and manipulating the brain. And when you then tell them, exactly the opposite. No, we're doing a laser surgery. And by the way, you won't even have an incision. We're just, it's like an injection. We are stabbing. This laser has a 1.6 millimeter uh, diameter. The twist drill is two millimeters or even putting these tiny depth electrodes in. It's amazing. And the patients actually don't have pain after that because they had almost an injection. That's revolutionizing. And actually, to be fair, 90% um, of our laser patients have refused before an open resection. When laser became available, all of a sudden the world changed. So that would be something. And some of them would say, I'd rather have three laser ablations until I become seizure free than having one open surgery. Now, one has to be careful because there are situations, cortical dysplasias, et cetera, where laser is not appropriate and you have to do an open resection. And I think there it is, it usually takes one to three visits or so to tell them, yes, this has a risk profile. This is not beginner's surgery. This is something that is complex, but it's, it's always, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to say this because I know that Brandy was at the NIH. Whenever somebody tells you uh, this, this clinical uh, research is really, it's very, very expensive. Uh, you can always tell them, try disease. And uh, <clears throat> you have to tell the patients, yeah, this is a risk procedure, but weigh this against a life with seizures, not being able to drive, not really able to work, not functioning in high complexity. Think about what the option of seizure freedom offers you. So it takes time. Um, but I think it's absolutely worthwhile. And the good thing is, coming back to the comprehensive epilepsy center, we have the pediatric and the adult social workers talking together and, and talking to the families, et cetera, to guide them to the point where they are being able to make what they should, which is an informed decision. Yeah, I completely uh, agree. I, I think that um, as well as we are doing in uh, medical advancements, um, the the things that impact overall health for people are not only the medical procedure that you get or don't get. It's also the social factors that determine um, your access to those kinds of treatments and your ability to uh, participate in in clinical trials or in in a surgical approach, for example. Um, so I think this exa uh, the example you gave, Dr. Warren, you gave, of, of people who would have said no to open surgery, which takes inpatient days in the hospital. You have to lose a lot of work. You have to have someone who can be in the hospital with you, you know, uh, often for that that period of time. That's not accessible to everyone. Uh, people have got to work for a living. Uh, they miss a day of work. They miss a paycheck. You know that, and that's it's not equally accessible to all all of us. Um, and so the idea that laser is um, equally effective at controlling the seizures better in, in many cases for some of the, um, the side effects and is, uh, you know, an out can sometimes be a, a much less invasive procedure is one that opens up that access to many more people. So I think that's 
we, we need to start paying attention to the way we deliver these therapies, the way we deliver the trials, so that they can be accessible um, to many, many more people than they have been in the past. Well, I am mindful that we're right at 315. And uh, not only did you both come through with the <clears throat> afternoon session, uh, you sailed us through so quickly uh, that I am frustrated that we are at the end of this talk. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Brandy. And I know uh, you tell me all the time that you're a research scientist, and I've told you before, you're Dr. Fuhrman to me. And so thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Dr. Warnicke, thank you for your leadership in this space. We're so proud to have you in the upper Midwest representing and moving the work of neurosurgery forward. Thank you uh, once again for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>